Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. If you're hearing my voice, it's we were having some technical difficulties in the timing booth and have been all morning. Um, and uh, we're just uh, regaining our footing. Um, okay, it looks like you're able to hear my voice out in a YouTube feed land. So uh, I can actually start my commentating for the Can-Am International. If you, uh, you've probably been watching, it's probably been very, very quiet. You've basically been looking at a nice surface and a number of uh, pairings uh, that have happened. We've just uh, finished, finished the 20th pairing of the um, uh, women's 500 meters. And so we had a... Um, we had a skater fall, uh, uh, Sophia Dvorak, and so anytime that happens, uh, you get out the uh, the ice maintenance crew uh, to make sure that it's safe once again. So they'll uh, they'll make sure that the ice is in good shape. And uh, in doing so, we've got a moment where I can just bring you up to speed on where we're at, where where we are at. So. Welcome to the Canem International Long Track Sp Sk Speed Skating Competition here in Calgary, Alberta. We're at the Calgary Olympic Oval, and what you're seeing on the screen is the top eight times. Uh, Carolina Hiller uh, leading the charge at uh, 39.56, uh, and uh, that would be... Uh, that is not neither a season or a personal best, but that's the fastest time of the morning. Abigail McCluskey, who just came back from uh, doing the 3000 in the World Cup in Poland at 38, 39 81. Then we got Callie Christ, just over 40 seconds. Blair Crookshank from the United States. We have a number of Americans up here at, at 40.3. Then Haley Bell and Victoria Goplin take the five and sixth position, fastest time. Sophia Bieber from Manitoba at 41.72, and Anna Bourgeois from Alberta. What I'm noticing this morning is the times are slower. Um, I'm not sure exactly why that is, if the ice is slower, if the barometric pressure uh, in the air has had some effect on the speeds, um, but the, I thought the times at, at this point in time anyway, in the speed skating season, we'd start to see some um, season's best challenge and even some personal best. I still think they're going to fall. Um, uh, because this is only the first race of, uh, of a three-day meet, and I'll talk more about that as time goes on. So we have an ice break right now. And so let me officially welcome uh, everybody to the Can-Am Long Track Speed Skating Competition. Uh, this, is, this is a single distance um, long track uh, event and the distances are the 500 meters to the 1,000, 1,500, 3,000, and 5,000, and the always exciting and entertaining mass start, uh, which is going to happen Saturday afternoon for the women and Sunday afternoon for the men. So we've got a power-packed three-day event, over 150 skaters, primarily from Canada, then the United States, Romania, Germany, France, um, and the number of skaters are down, um, but, but that's primarily pandemic-related. So on the screen, you're looking at two Manitoba provincial team athletes. You've got uh, Lindsay Smart in the uh, inner lane and Antonio Villa in the outer lane. Uh, the last time Lindsay Smart raced her 500 meters would be back uh, almost almost two years ago, Antonio Villa uh, this, uh, this fall. So Lindsay Smart would like to better her time of 48-43 and Antonia at 47-43. What you're seeing is both coaches. You've got Will Dutton and Scott Van Horn who's assisting the provincial team, Will Dutton, down the back stretch. Uh, and they are coaching, encouraging, uh, and guiding uh, these athletes as they round the final corner into the straightaway. Lindsay Smart, uh, who started in the inner lane, uh, looks like she is going to finish uh, first. And she's going to do so at a time of 44.83 and Antonio Villa at 46.82. So both times are personal bests for these young skaters from Manitoba.
these next two skaters. This is this is by the way pairing number twenty two. There's twenty seven pairings um, in the women's, and then we're going to do ten pairings of the men's, and then we're going to have an uh, an ice resurfacing. That's the bell lap, and the five hundred meters with the opening time of uh, or the opening hundred meters, they always ring a bell, and that signals there's four hundred meters uh, to go. A five hundred meter race is one and a quarter laps. You can see the coaches encouraging these young skaters who are in their early years of development uh, to develop a rhythm with their arms, uh, to encourage them uh, to develop that technique to go faster. Um, so while they uh, round the turn and head to the straightaway, I'd like to say hello to Matt to Johnston of the Johnston Group. The Johnston Group is from Manitoba. They're one of the premier sponsors of the Speed Skating Manitoba uh, Association. Uh, they've been tremendous supporters, uh, 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 financial and uh, uh, supporters for uh, the young speed skaters, the provincial team and the provincial development team. And so Matt Johnston, I know you've tuned in. Uh, shouldn't you be working actually um, but if you're turning in live welcome because uh, the time here is around uh, it's around 1030 Calgary time so it'd be 1130 Manitoba time you can also watch this um, at a different time at any time you want because they save these uh, they save the footage on these so you've got okay so you've got a couple this is this is pairing um, this is pairing number 23 uh, Talia Halperin from uh, British Columbia and Julia Smith uh, from uh, from Saskatchewan, you see Tim Comfort is the uh, is the coach from Saskatchewan. Has been coaching the Saskatchewan team for a long time. He brought out I don't know how many Saskatchewan skaters, probably 15 to 20 for a camp this past week. And uh, Manitoba is well represented. So at one point in time, you'd see a lot of green uh, skin suits on the ice, and then you'd see a lot of yellow and black as well. Uh, it's great to see all these skaters out um, for this uh, November meet. So what do we got for times here? We've got Julia Smith crossing the line at 50.06 and Talia in at 51.6. So both of these skaters in their early years of developing um, uh, the speed skating uh, technique and the fitness that goes with it have achieved personal bests. So it's always good. PBs, as we say in the lingo of speed skating, personal best is always what you want to get. Uh, every time you skate. Not, it's easier in the early years, but as the later years go on and your times get lower, it gets more and more difficult. So we've got, we've got a couple of, um, of Alberta skaters, Greer uh, Kello, and she's uh, in uh, the inside lane, and Denise Westland is in the outer lane. Now it's a false start. So one of the two, I, didn't, I couldn't tell which one false started, but you're only allowed one false start. So no matter who... You're only allowed one, so if there's a second false start, no matter who false started the first time, uh, whoever false starts the second time is disqualified. Uh, the, the athletes don't want that, and the starters don't want that. Basically, the whole idea is you want the skaters on the start line to be as still as possible, and, um, and, and, the, and the starters uh, watch for that very carefully. So if you've just tuned in, we're just gaining our traction here and getting our audio and our video uh, uh, up to speed. We've had some technical difficulties inside the oval. Uh, while I'm commentating up in the timing booth right now, I'm unable to commentate or rather announce inside the oval as there's some tech technical difficulties and they're working on that right now. And so I get to talk to you, whoever is uh, watching uh, on the YouTube feed. And there's Greer and Denise, and they've just finished off. Uh, with what I would say is two personal bests for these young ladies. So congratulations uh, to these two. If your family member is watching, you can be very proud of them. That's the 24th pairing. There is 27. And what you see on the screen are the times that these young skaters can aspire to. 30, you know, 39, 40, 41, 42 seconds. Um, a lot of those skaters that achieve those times, they're uh, they're well through. They're well, they're well into their late teens, even the, in into their twenties. This is primarily a developmental meet. You'll have some senior skaters uh, and some national team skaters, but mostly uh, developmental. Um, a lot of the long track world uh, Canadian uh, skaters are in uh, Norway this weekend uh, for the second of four World Cups. And I'll talk more about that as the weekend uh, goes on. And if you're, if you're tuning in, um, I, I just want to let you know that I've got a couple of great interviews happening uh, over the weekend. Uh, Simon Coots, who's a senior skater 
uh, yeah, a part of the Oval program years ago, but skates out of Calgary. He's had a really um, a fun career, a very good career in speed skating. Uh, is incredibly knowledgeable about the sport, and he's going to join me this afternoon through the lunch hour. So that's around 1.30 uh, Winnipeg time. That would be 12.30 Calgary time. Uh, stay tuned for that. He's going to join me for about an hour and a half, and uh, we're going to cover a number of subjects. And uh, everything you wanted to know about speed skating or a number of skaters, uh, but we're afraid to ask, uh, Simon, um, S- Simon can uh, share some insight because he knows a lot of these athletes. So we've got Elizabeth Smith and Calla Hyam. Uh, and uh, they are both from British Columbia. And I don't have the times that they covered off here. Oh, here we got uh, 48.42 for Smith and Hyam at 49.74. And those are personal bests uh, for both Elizabeth and Calla. So uh, well done, ladies. This is the second last pairing of the 27 pairings in the female 500 meters here at the can International Meet here in Calgary, Alberta at the beautiful Olympic Oval. Mo- Molly Morris from Saskatchewan uh, started out in the outside lane and Margaret Breedlove uh, from Alberta is in the inside lane. Unfortunately, unfortunately, I, it, uh, I won't be playing music for the 500 meters because it's a very short race. Plus, uh, the YouTube police uh, uh, keeps track of, uh, you know, songs that are being played that if we don't have permission to do, they, they do have the ability to shut us down. But generally, they just give you a uh, hand slap and say, uh, don't do that. Uh, so basically, you're going to be um, listening to my voice uh, and the bell and maybe some cheering uh, through over the next uh, three days. So how did Molly? Uh, how did Molly do? They both. I don't have the times in front of me. So we've got one final pairing. Well, Molly Morris is at fifty-two uh, forty-one, and uh, we had Mark Breedlove at fifty-five ninety-eight. So, so Margaret, Margaret will get a PB, our personal best. This final pairing only has one skater in it, and it's Mili, uh, Mila Rieben, and she's from Saskatchewan. She's a fairly quick skater at 42.13 is her, is her personal best. Her season's best so far this year is 43.09. Going to be challenging to do that, um, uh, but for a couple reasons. She's only uh, the single skater. You always get another, having another skater pushes you. But the times, are, from my perspective, when I can tell off the personal best and season's best, are notably slower uh, today, and I'm not exactly sure why. Um, she crosses uh, the line, and let's find out what her time is. She crosses the line at 43.16, just above her season's best. I'm sorry. Uh, on the YouTube. Here. I'm going to go over here. For- so that completes uh, the 27 pairings of the 500 meters. If anybody that uh, knows me, I'm, my name's Greg Weber. I'm a speed skating dad from uh, Winnipeg. And um, happy to announce and commentate um, when I'm in town. Oh, there's there's the list up there. There's the top eight times in the 500 meter ladies. We're about to go to the 500 meter men's, the first 10 pairings before you do an ice flame. But Carolina Hiller goes into the books at a 39.56 time frame. Okay, well, that's, um, I guess we're switching gears right now and we're moving uh, right to, to the men. But Carolina Hiller uh, will, uh, will, have the fa- will go in as uh, having the fastest time today for the women's. Uh, but I was saying if anybody is, uh, that, I, that knows me listens in, give me, uh, let me know the feedback on how the sound is and if you can hear any background noise at all. Uh, is it clear? Is it making any sense? Uh, as you look on the screen, you're seeing a couple Saskatchewan uh, 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 racers. We got Kayla Makowski uh, and we got Oscar Stack Makashu, and they are from Saskatchewan. 
uh, coached by Tim Comfort, uh, primarily. And uh, let's have a look at uh, their personal bests, uh, 43.56 for Calum and 44.01 for Oscar. Now, we've got a false start. Don't know exactly who did the false starting. Um, but we don't want another false start. We want them to be still off the line. Nice, clean start. Fair for everybody. Both the starters and the athletes and everybody else wants that. And we've got a nice clean start now. So let's have a look at the opening time for Calum is 11.38 and 11.54 for Makashu. So that'll be the first, there's Tim Comfort. You'll see him down the back scratch. Obviously he coaches uh, both of those skaters and quite a contingent in from Saskatchewan, which is absolutely terrific. Great support for speed skating. A number of Saskatchewan athletes have come uh, part to Calgary to live and go to university and then be part of the Oval program. So on the inside lane was Caleb Makowski. He's going to finish in the outer and uh, the opposite is for Oscar. So Oscar Stack Makashu comes in at 41-53. Uh, and that will be a personal best for him. And Caleb Makowski at 42-68. That'll be both a personal best and a season's best. So we've got a couple of... PBs that have fallen here in the opening pair uh, of the men's 500. And there are 38 pairings. There are 38 pairings uh, of the men's. There was 27. So there is over 150 skaters. And we'll be doing the 500 again. Uh, we'll be doing that on, uh, on Sunday. So today it's going to be the 500 meters uh, for men and women. Then we'll do the 1,000 meters. Uh, and then we're going to do the 3,000 meter women's uh, later this afternoon. Um, on Saturday, we'll have the 1,000 meters, uh, the 5,000 meters for the men, and then always the entertaining, always the entertaining mass start for the women. Now we've got a nice clean start here. We've got Matthew Mitchell uh, from uh, British Columbia and Max Williams from Saskatchewan. With more skaters from each of the provinces represented, you have more fans, you have more, more parents and more friends uh, and fa family members who are, uh, who are uh, supporting uh, these skaters. So, Matthew Mitchell started in the inner lane. He's going to finish in the outer lane. Looks like he has the orange outfit. He's representing British Columbia. 43.93 is a time he would like to beat because that's his personal best. And 45.69... Uh, for uh, Max Williams. So 43.37, Mitchell comes in and beats it. So he's got a PB. And Max Williams, 45.69, uh, he blew that personal. So we got a couple personal bests from these two gentlemen. Matthew Mitchell and Max Williams, congratulations. Well, we're in the third pairing of the 500-meter men's race in the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition here in Calgary, Alberta. You're watching a skater uh, from Ontario. His name is Joshua Sutherland. He started in the inside lane. He's going to finish in the outer. And Benjamin Conwicky from Alberta. And he's going to finish in the inside lane. And they're down the back, back stretch rather, and finishing the final um, corner. And here comes Joshua Sutherland. Keep an eye on his time. 43-49. He has a PB for him. And he crosses the line at 41-86 and obliterates his personal best. And 44-08 for Benjamin Conwicky. And that's just above. That will be a season's best for uh, Conwicky. So congratulations, congratulations to Joshua, Joshua Sutherland on a, just a tremendous personal best. We are now moving to, to pairing a number four. But in this pairing, we're only going to have a one skater. Uh, we have uh, uh, the one, one skater, Octavian Moga, has, has scratched, as the, the words they use, uh, in uh, the world of speed skating. So we have a gentleman by the name of Zachary Jensen. And he's from the United States. 
And his both season's best and personal best is 44.91. So, again, challenging because you don't have another skater pushing you. And it might seem like you're competing against another skater, but you're really not. You're really competing with uh, uh, the clock. Now, Zachary Jensen's opening 100 meters is 11.84, sixth best of the group. Um, and so down the straightaway he goes. He would love to best that time of 44.91. Um, let's see how he makes out. We want him to do that. The ice looks fast, but it's feeling slow given the times that are um, that I that that appear to be uh, being achieved. Although in the early going of the men, um, what we are seeing is some PBs and seasons best dropping. And 43:16 is his time, and he can go back to the United States proud of that time because that's a PB or a personal best for Zachary Jensen of the U.S. Okay, so we are we are in pairing number five of the first ten pairings, and after that we are gonna we are going to have an ice resurfacing. So, uh, so we have two two uh, skaters from Alberta, uh, Evan uh, Boyce. Uh, he's side and. and Eight thirty one. It looks like a quick start. Very much early in their speed skating careers. And let's see what their opening times are. The, the bell lap has gone off. They've crossed the first 100 meters. And an 11.55 for Boyce and Chomin in an 11.62. So Boyce has fallen, almost taking out Chimin. Chomin. We'll have to have an ice check. But Merrick is going to uh, finish off in the inside lane. I hope Evan Boyce is okay. That's what the padding's for. Didn't look too bad because he went in back first, and that's uh, they've been trained to do that if that sometimes happens. But he cut across and almost took out uh, Chomin, but Chomin crosses the line at 43-14. Not to be uh, disturbed in any way, he achieves the personal best by by over five seconds. So... I don't know when he raced last, but uh, that's a good chunk of time. Is to get personal best now. It's going to be a little bit harder. But Evan Boyce uh, did not finish the race, but Merrick Choman um, uh, is uh, very much a personal best. So now you're looking at the uh, uh, the top eight times. We're very much uh, early uh, in the 500 meter men's race. That was pairing number five of the first 10. Um, there is uh, 38 pairings in total. Um, the fastest raiders, fastest skaters have yet to uh, race and that'll happen after the ice resurfacing. And so you'll see some, so while well, Oscar Stack, Makashu has got the first, the opening, or the best time of 41.53, uh, uh, and that's a, and that's a, um, and that's a very much a personal best for, for Oscar. Uh, the times you're going to see ahead are in the 34 to 35 range uh, after the ice resurface, or, uh, uh, ice resurfacing. All right, I'll get my lingo going here yet. We've got Mateus Daniels um, and Isaac Emblen. Uh, Mateus is from uh, British Columbia, and Isaac is from uh, Ontario. Got the flags? Er so that's something I usually see once a meet. The exact time, either a finish, more often it's usually the opening times. 12.33 for both of them. So look, let's see how they finish. 48.02 is a time that Mateus Daniels would like the best, and Isaac Emblem at 49.28. They've rounded the final corner. Um, Mateus Daniels uh, will finish first. He started in the inner lane. He will finish in the outer lane, and he crosses the line at 45.30. Best his personal best by three seconds, and so Isaac Emblem also with a personal best by at least two seconds. Uh, early in their development as a speed skater, always nice to get personal bests. That's what they're after. That's what they live for. That's what they train for as they grow and develop and evolve as speed skaters. 
I should give a shout out to the man on the microphone, Sean Ireland, a former world class speed skater and himself, now working out of the Calgary Oval and a fellow Winnipegger. He's a fellow Winnipegger, and so a couple Winnipeggers up on the timing deck, challenging the rest of the staff here at the in the in the Oval. So what we got Mitchell Wessling here from Alberta. Um, he's got a personal best of uh, 48.02, and Eric Kobaki from Manitoba. And uh, he, this will be Eric's first time to the Oval, so he has not posted a time. So this, uh, whatever time he posts will be his personal best and season's best. So Kobaki started off in the outer lane. He's going to finish off in the, in the inner lane, and here he comes. Being cheered on you, by the Manitoba contingent. And Kobaki crosses the line at 44.08, so he can book that into his personal best um, uh, diary, if you will, uh, resume, and uh, and work from there. Mitchell Wessling in at 45.39, and that's a personal best for him. So we are seeing personal best falling for these skaters who either haven't skated a while, um, and uh, as, so in the in the time that from the last time they've skated, they've grown up almost two years which has been the last time some of them raced because that's exactly what the pandemic did is uh, is uh, slow us down in terms of uh, in terms of our competitions but we're back we are back and we're watching watching uh, the 500 meter men's race at the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition here in Calgary Alberta you're watching Zachary Adelman or rather Edelman Zachary Edelman from Alberta and Miko Veeman, his dad's skating later today, uh, Chris, and he's from Saskatchewan. So Edelman, it looks like he's going to cross the line first and he's going to do so at a time of 43.63 and that'll be a personal best and a season's best for him and Miko Veeman comes in at 46.59 and it's been a while since he raced because his last PB was 56 and change. Uh, that's a 10 second personal best so a, a obviously a younger skater it's been a while and uh, there's the high five or low five by the coach to the athlete because Nico and Zachary should be very proud of their races Gillen Goud is from British Columbia, and uh, this may be his first uh, 500 meters um, in terms of sanctioned time, because uh, I don't have any times for him as a personal best or a season's best when I did my homework. Um, obviously, he's been skating a while because he's booked in a 43.09 time, so um, uh, that's a great uh, personal best, uh, and for him now to take that lower at every opportunity. Now we got a couple of legends on the ice. A couple of guys that have been skating for a number of years. You've got Bill Blonsky in the inner lane. And you've got Werner Meyer uh, in the outer lane. Werner's, look, so, so let, me, let me tell you a little bit about something about both of these uh, gentlemen. They're both from Alberta. Werner Meyer uh, has been an official for many, many years. He's been around the sport of ski, ski, speed skating for uh, decades. And Werner's, I, he's well into his 80s. He could be 82, 83, all of that for sure. Uh, Bill Blonsky's in his early 50s. Uh, and Bill has a love of speed skating. Um, and uh, through an, an incident many years ago, it, uh, it changed Bill. Um, but not to the point where his love of speed skating uh, dissipated. Uh, he just simply comes out, loves to skate. He's a part of the fabric of the speed skating community. And, um, and they're doing it for the love of the sport. Um, and I would think that both of these gentlemen are inspirational for two, for two different reasons. Um, uh, Werner Meyer, because here's... Here's, here's a man uh, into his 80s, and he helps out um, uh, the speed skating community and the officials. Um, but to do that at 80, it's amazing. Um, 
a lot of people aren't as active or as mobile uh, at that age. So Werner Meyer is an inspiration, uh, showing how someone can age great, gracefully and athletically. And Bill Blonsky, someone who's overcome an, a la an accident many years ago um, and is still uh, an opportunity to, to function uh, on some level. And speed skating is one of his ways to do that. So Blonsky crosses the line at 114.33. Almost a season's best. He's just off that. Werner Meyer, 117.86. Well off his PB. So there's the lineup. There's the first eight fastest times. Um, and um, uh, Oscar Stack Makashu from Saskatchewan at 41.53. Joshua Sutherland, 41.85. And Kayla Makowski at 42.68. So at this point, the time right now is 10.56 Alberta time. Is that Mountain Daylight time? Is that what that is? And uh, we are now going to take uh, a break from resurfacing. And we're going to have an ice uh, resurfacing. So what you see on the screen now is what you're going to see till 11.15. And uh, we look forward to coming back, and we're going to continue on with the 500-meter men's uh, races here at the Can-Am International Long Track Competition here at the Calgary Olympic Oval here in Calgary, Alberta. Test, test. Testing, testing. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. 
test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. Test, testing. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Test, test, one, two, three, test, test. Testing, one, two, three, test, test. Test, test. Testing, one, two, three. Test, test.
Yes. Testing, testing. Testing, testing. Just testing the audio again. Test, test.
Welcome back. Welcome back to the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition. We're well underway. This is day one of three days. We're now watching the 500 meter races. Later this afternoon will be the 1,000 meter races. And then uh, to finish off the day, we'll have the uh, women's 3,000 meter races. So we are continuing on in the men's 500 meter races. Uh, my name is Greg Bieber. I'm going to occupy the audio space of the YouTube feed that you're watching. Uh, unable to uh, bring life into the oval at this point as we're still having some more technical difficulties for those inside the oval. But if they happen to be having a smart device and connecting to the live webcast that is being produced by John Little and Sean Ireland, uh, you get to hear my voice and I get to watch what you watch on the screen. So this, there are 38 pairings in the 500 meter men's race. This is the 11th pairing, or you could say the first pairing of this final grouping. So Anders Johnson uh, and Joshua Telzen, both from British Columbia. Now we saw some, uh, we saw some earlier times, but now we are going to go into some faster skaters. Uh, opening time for Telzen is 9.9, Johnson in at 10.04. Now, personal best for uh, Johnson is 35.32. Tells in at 35.41. Let's see how they made out. We're seeing slower times at the faster skater level, if that makes any sense. Anders Johnson comes in at 35.6. And that is just off his season's best. And tells in at uh, 35.4. And that, in fact, is a personal best by one one hundredth of a second for, for Joshua Telzen. So he's going to be happy with that. Here's a couple of other fast skaters. This is this is uh, Frank Roth. The, this is Frank Roth of Alberta, and Cooper Eamon from uh, Nova Scotia. But we have a skater down, and uh, and that looks like uh, Frank Roth. So. If a skater starts in the inside lane, he'll finish in the outside lane. So starting in the outer lane and finishing the inner would be Cooper Eamon looking for a time to best at 35.10. That's his PB. He comes across at 35.66. Unfortunately, Frank, Frank Roth did not finish the race. Uh, his, uh, both of these guys have the same exact same personal bet time at 35.10. But his time, Cooper Eamon, 35.66. So when a skater uh, falls down, and it happens because these skaters are skating at very, very fast speeds, um, they now will check out the ice. Uh, safety is paramount, as you can tell by having the padding all the way around this 400-meter, uh, 13-meter ice-wide track uh, to limit uh, the injuries by the skaters. Uh, and now the ice crew will check out the ice, and if there's any blemish to it, any um, if it's damaged in any way, uh, what they will do is they will repair it and make it safe for the skaters. So Joshua Tellison books in the fastest time of the 500-meter men's, as you can see on the screen, at 35.4. Anders Johnson right there at 35.6. Cooper Eamon in at 35.66. And the first... Uh, so what they end up doing is running the fastest skaters in the second half of these pairings and the reason we had an ice resurfacing is simply because we have a lot of skaters uh, and the starters and the skaters uh, move through the 500 meter races at a fairly brisk uh, pace so if you've just joined us this is a live youtube feed from calgary alberta and you're at the we are looking at the calgary while well, you're looking at the top eight times so far in the 500 meter men's but this is a long track speed skating competition it's called the can-am international it's a number of it's a number of competitions that have happened this year uh one month ago in october you had the long track champ championships held here uh, where the top 20 long track speed skaters in all the disciplines uh, raced but it was co-mingled with uh, 
um, another meet, another almost developmental meet called the Oval International. And, um, and that happened. That was over five days in October. In September, we had something called the Fall Classic. There are more meets um, uh, ahead throughout the year. Speed skating is alive and well and back after almost two years of not competing other than the bubble over in Europe uh, earlier this year. If hockey had a bubble, then speed skating can have a bubble. And they did. Speed skating's all over the world happening. If you ever want to check out uh, what's going on in the speed skating world, up-to-date results, check out speedskatingresults.com. It'll tell you everything you need to know about stats. The skaters uh, from all around the world, the countries, the, the, all the various tracks, the records that have been broken, the season's best, um, and, all, and, and current re results. So... We're broadcasting this from Calgary, Alberta, in Canada, and the top long track speed skaters in Canada are in um, Norway, with the exception of Abigail McCluskey, who is back. Uh, she raced the 3,000 meters in Poland, and uh, now they're in Norway, and then they'll come back for a week break, and then continue on the World Cup, the third of four World Cups, so they'll head off to Salt Lake City, uh, and then come back to Calgary for the fourth and final World Cup, uh, which would be the second, uh, which would be the second um, uh, weekend uh, in uh, December here in Calgary. And then the big lead up ahead of the Olympics, which is the first uh, two weeks of February in Beijing, is in Quebec City between Christmas and New Year's. They have three long track meets all squished together. They're going to have the Canada Cup two. Um, they're going to have the qualifiers for the Junior World Championships, and they're going to have what they call the Olympic Skate Off, uh, and that is where the Olympic hopefuls uh, will hopefully get a chance to show their stuff uh, and then post the times that they need to be to be on the team to represent our country in Beijing in February of 2022. So we're ready to go again. We're back back racing the ice is fixed you're looking at two skaters on the start line the 500 meters which is one and a quarter laps around the track christopher fiola uh he is from quebec uh, uh and he is in uh, the inside lane looks like he has gonna have a spider start which will dutton one of the fastest starters in the world used to do studied his starts immensely and uh ching yang sung uh, in the outer lane and he'll be in the he's in the blue skin suit so these skaters are fast uh, Fiola's uh, personal best time is 3455 so his opening time is 984 and that's the best so far of this grouping Ching Yang Sung is at 34 uh, 60 threat of 36 six, sorry 3464 for a PB and 3626 is the season's best let's see how they cross Fiola does a 3508 uh, which is just above his personal best in Sung Ying Chang. Um, uh, Ching Yang, rather, will be at 35.93, and that will be a season's best for Sung. Okay, so we are all right so we are we are in the 14th pairing of, of uh, 38 pairings for the men and uh, in the inside lane you've got Jun Hong Im from Korea and in the outer lane Jess Neufeld from Manitoba these skaters are both very fast as well So, Jun Hong uh, started in the inside lane. He'll finish in the outer lane. He's in the orange outfit. He's rounding out the final corner uh, first, and here he comes down uh, the straightaway. He'll be looking to best his time of 35.72. That'll be a PB. Let's see how he makes out at 35.78. That'll be a season's best for him, but just off his personal best. Just Newfeld in at 36.63, uh, and no personal best or season's best for Jess on this one. 
fellow Manitoban he is. Congratulations, gentlemen. The next two skaters um, are both from Alberta. In the inside lane is Cody Miller, and in the outer lane is Paul Kader. Uh, these are both teammates, friends, and competitors. Uh, Miller crosses the opening time of the 100 meters first between the two at 10.11, Coderre at 10.25. Uh, Miller's uh, season's best is 36.33, and Coderre's in at 36.55. Let's see how they make out. They're both rounding the turn. Very even skaters. Looks like they're going to cross the line almost at the same time. Let's see who crosses first, and it'll be Coderre at 36.55 which ties his uh, season's best, and Cody Miller in at 36.61. I'm hoping to have a chance with Cody Miller um, tomorrow, actually. It depends on his schedule, but he's an encyclopedia and very passionate about the sport of speed skating, a lot like Simon Coots. Um, and they'll um, uh, experts in their, in, in their particular sport, and I'd love to um, have a conversation with them. So that's ahead. Also, Scott Van Horn of Van Horn Skates. I'm going to be talking to him at some point in the weekend. And Bonnie Blair is in the house. Her daughter, Blair Crookshank, uh, is racing. She's one of the uh, many Americans that are up uh, from, um, from, from the States uh, competing in the Can-Am International. That's, of course, that's why they call it the Can-Am, uh, Can Canadian and American International. So, with one false start, Ahead, we've got the 16th pairing. Again, a couple of Alberta skaters. They know each other well. Jalen Doan is in the inside lane. If you look at it, he's got sort of the yellow strip around uh, his hoodie. And Max Halleck in the outer lane, and he's wearing the glasses. So Halleck and Joan, uh, Doan rather, uh, hopefully they bring out the best of each other. They compete against the clock, but the idea is to, to get the fastest time they possibly can. Season's best or personal best. That's what we're after. Joan, Jalen Doan, rather, 36.28 would be his season's best, 36.54 for Halleck, Max Halleck. Let's see how they finish up as they go down the, uh, the straightaway. Doan is going to cross the line first at 36.49, and Halleck in at 36.55. Halleck just off his season's best, um, and that's uh, the times in for this particular race, which is... Pairing number 16. Pairing number 17 is Ryan Gibson. He's from Ontario. He's in the inside lane, so he's wearing the black outfit. You can see that from even this end of the false start. There was movement on the line. The starters want them to be still. And Zachary Lacroix is in the outer lane. He's from Alberta. Uh, he's wearing the blue outfit that says actually Alberta on the back. So Gibson in the black skin suit, Lacroix in the blue skin suit. 36.40-ish uh, for season's best and personal best. Let's see how they make out uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this particular race. Let's hope for a clean start. It's harder to start the second time for these racers because they don't want to make a mistake. Neither one wants to be disqualified. Whoever makes, whoever gets DQ'd the second time doesn't race. It doesn't matter if that person didn't move uh, or, or didn't get a false start on the first one. So here we are. We've got Ryan Gibson from Ontario who started in the inside lane. And he's going to finish in the outer lane. He's in the black skin suit, Zachary Lacroix. Uh, will finish in the inside lane. Let's see how their times in here. They come back down the straightaway. Uh, finishing. Gibson's going to cross the line first at a time of 36.48, just off his season's best, and Zachary Lacroix, 36.83, uh, just off their season's best as well. And this is what we're seeing, uh, other than um, the skaters who were very, very early in their, in their careers, we're seeing um, the more advanced skaters tougher to get their PBs and season's best so far. But it's early in the meet, and um, they've got another 500 yet to go uh, later in the weekend on Sunday, to be exact. I love starts like that. So this pairing, this is the 18th pairing. 
But there's only one skater in it. And if you're wondering what that skin suit looks like, that's actually a Romanian skin suit. It's Cosma Nadilia. And he's from Romania. And, uh, and his PB and season best is uh, 3674. The challenge is for him is to best that. Always an uphill battle when you're skating just by yourself. Uh, and uh, however, let's see how he makes out. He's going to cross the line at 36-37. And Cosman Nadilia from Romania, you should be very proud. You and your coach should be very proud. You can tell, right? He's giving him a thumbs up. They know right away when they know how they have a good race. And Cosman um, not only got a season's best, but he got a personal best as well. Congratulations, Cosman. All right, we are back. We're in the 19th pairing of the 500-meter men's race at the Can-Am International here in Calgary, Alberta at the Olympic Oval. Long track speeding, speed skating competition. In this pairing, we've got Hobbs Holzer, who will finish in the outer lane from Alberta, and Eric Orlowski, who is from British uh, Columbia. And uh, their uh, season's best are just over 37. Looks like Holzer's going to cross the line first. Let's see how he makes out. He does 37.10. He has a season's best there. And Hobbs Holzer, Holzer in at 37.45 and just off his season's best there. So in the previous two races pairing... Um, uh, in well, previous three. So in, in pairing number 17, Zachary Lacroix, and we just saw Hobbs Holzer. These two skaters from Alberta, obviously wearing the color blue representing Alberta. Too bad we had a false start here with Kim Dong Wu and Chris Holmstead, but I'll talk about them in a moment. But I've just been provided some intel from a very good friend of mine named Mark Poulin, uh, who is also a referee uh, and also... He um, uh, handles an Alberta club uh, as well. Very passionate about the sport of speed skating. And his son is also a speed skater, um, both long track and short track. Uh, and we may, I'm not sure if we'll see him this weekend or not. I don't think so. I, haven't, I didn't see his name on the list. But I hope I get a chance to say hi to Mark. Perhaps he's officiating. But what he was telling me, what he was informing me on, is that the blue skin suits that that Hobbs Holzer and Zachary Lacroix were wearing are brand new. They're just off the production line. And they're new to speed skating Alberta along with the, the, the branding. Uh, and so uh, these are the new, what they refer to as bio racer skin suits. Bio racer skin suits. They look fantastic. And if it makes them go faster uh, in style, uh, then uh, congratulations to Bio Racer and Hobbs, uh, Hobbs and Zachary. Thanks for uh, being a fashion statement as well, as well as an elite athlete. So thanks, Mark, for that. We got a clean start here with Kim Dong Woo uh, in the inner lane. We'll finish off in the outer lane, and Chris Holmstead. Kim is, uh, by the way, from Korea. I didn't mention that, and Chris is from uh, from Ontario. So. I don't have a time for Kim, so uh, it's going to be what it's going to be in terms of my announcing. He's going to finish off uh, his time first, and he's going to come in. Here. At a time of 37.44, and Chris Holmsen in at 36.84. Uh, for Chris Holmstead, that is a personal best. And uh, so congratulations, uh, Chris. I'm going to check out uh, uh, Kim uh, Dong Wu's time to see where that stacks up with his personal best uh, as well. 
Okay, we're back with a couple of Alberta racers. And let me guess, they're wearing the new Bio Racer skin suits, Mark Poulin. We've got Caden Witowski in the inside lane. He'll finish off in the outer lane. And Yang Kun, Yang Kun Zhao, uh, also from Alberta. Um, and he'll finish off in the uh, inside lane. Third, just over 37 is their season's best and personal best for these two skaters. So we're going to have uh, Yang Kun uh, Yang Kun Zhao can't cross line at 36.95. He's going to be really happy with that time uh, because that is a personal best. Witowski in at 38.31. But Yang Kun Zhao, personal best and a season's best as well. Okay, we are in pairing number 22 of 38 pairings in the 500-meter men's race in the Can-Am International. If you're watching from the United States, you can uh, cheer on Augie Herman, who started in the outer lane and uh, from Minnesota, but now uh, goes to school uh, near Milwaukee and trains out of there and is coached by, um, by uh, uh, Bonnie Blair's husband, uh, Crookshank. Mr. Crookshank, I don't know his first name. <laughs> I'll find out. <laughs> Dave Crookshank and Craig Miller from British Columbia. And I've been talking lots, and I want to just give you an update here. Craig Miller crosses the line at 37.31, and it's just he's just off his season's best. Augie at 37.61, and Augie. Uh, and that's a PB for him, but also that time is going to allow him to qualify for the Junior Worlds in terms of funding. He needed a time just below 37.61. So, Augie Herman, I think you've got some money coming your way. So, congratulations to you. Okay, we're in the 23rd pairing, um, and we've got Andre Erasmus from Alberta in the inside lane. So he's going to finish off in the outer lane in the yellow outfit. Yellow skin suit is Joel Simpson from Manitoba, and he'll finish off in the inside lane. Unfortunately, Andre Erasmus fell on the final turn. Hope he's okay. Joel Simpson's going to finish the line, finish the race solo, 37-60. 3767 is a number that he's going to want to beat, and let's see how he comes out. 3722. And he's going to be happy with that. Look at that. He's given a fist pump. And he's going to give a low five to Mike Ireland, his coach. Congratulations to Joel Simpson from Manitoba with a new PB. And he's getting a hand as well as uh, Andre Erasmus for getting up. And everything is okay. I just love it when these athletes get personal best and season's best. And... That's my my invested interest as a passionate supporter of speed skating. And, of course, the athletes, the coaches, and the family members, all the supporting cast uh, love it as well. So with Andre uh, Erasmus, unfortunately, falling on that race, they, they are going to check the ice to see if um, it's uh, safe to continue. So while they're fixing the ice, I've asked um, one of our uh, one of our uh, uh, YouTube technicians to give us uh, a list of the times. So this is what you're looking at: Christopher Fiola um, from Quebec, 30 to 35:08 uh, for for Fiola, and um, and that's the top time today. Tell us in at 35.4. Uh, which tied his, uh, I believe, tied his uh, season's best. No, that's actually a personal best, uh, as well as a season's best. we got Anders Johnson at 35.6, Kerper Eamon from Nova Scotia at 35.66, and you can read the rest off there. Uh, but those are the top uh, eight times. It's going to be, um, we'll see how the others do uh, moving forward, but those are the fastest skaters um, so far of this, of this grouping. So I've just heard the whistle from the starters, and then we're going to go now back to the 500-meter start line. 
and we're going to we're going to watch uh, pairing number twenty four. And the two skaters you're looking at on the right side of your screen or their left, the inside lane in the yellow outfit, that's Owen Hack from Manitoba. He's now living out in Calgary, working, living, and going to school. Um, Owen has the ability to lay down some very fast times. Uh, his season's best is 38.15. 37.88 is his personal best. Emil Hodzak Santor. Uh, from Ontario has a PB, a personal, rather a season's best, and a personal best of 37.9. So I expect a fairly fast competitive race. Unfortunately, we've got a false start again. We've had a number of those uh, this morning. Somebody was moving off the line. So while we get set for this next pairing, if you've just joined us, this is the 24th pairing of the 500 meter men's race in the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition here in Calgary, Alberta. This is a YouTube feed. And we got Owen Hack in the yellow outfit representing Manitoba and Emil Hodzak Santer in the looks like red and black outfit. Should be a fairly close race between the two. So the opening 100 meters is uh, Owen, Owen Hack in at 10.58 and Hack is down on the first turn. Hazak Santer at 10.60 for his opening and continues on down the back stretch and will finish off uh, in uh, the inside lane. So here we go. Hodzak Santer is going to cross the line, and um, he, was, he wants to look to beat a time of 37.90, uh, which um, he's well off that personal and season's best. He comes in at 38.44. With uh, Owen Hack uh, falling, I, uh, hopefully he is okay. Uh, there is going to be, uh, again, an ice delay. Uh, so the ice maintenance crew uh, can, uh, uh, can fix the ice and make it safe for uh, the skaters moving along. So that was, that was pairing number 24. Uh, we actually have pairings all the way out uh, to, um, there's 38. Actually, I think there's even 40 pairings. So much more racing ahead. But those are the times that you're seeing. So maybe I'll take this opportunity to talk a little bit about the Calgary Oval, uh, the facility itself, uh, because the first, the first, um, the first indoor uh, oval, um, permanent structure indoor oval was built in uh, 1985. It's hard to believe that that it it seems actually, even though it's many years ago, uh, the uh, it, it it you'd think that we'd maybe perhaps built um, indoor ovals much earlier than that. But up until that point, uh, anything that was built would be temporary. Uh, but mostly speed skating was an outdoor event. So that first indoor oval was built in uh, Germany in 1985. And, and a couple of years later, guess which uh, oval was built after that? Uh, it's the Calgary Oval, Calgary Olympic Oval. It was completed uh, in 1987 uh, in preparation for the Olympics. That was uh, 34 years ago this, uh, this September, in 19th fall of 87. And the, uh, this February will be 34 years uh, when, uh, in, uh, from 1988 when Calgary hosted uh, the Winter Olympics. And just a few short, a few, uh, just a short distance away is McMahon Stadium where they play the Calgary Stampeders, play the Canadian Football, play their, you know, play in the Canadian Football League. And uh, that's where they had the opening ceremonies. And um, a little fun, little known fun fact for you is that that two former athletes brought in the the um, uh, 
brought in the carried in the torch and Kathy Priestner um, uh, along with Ken Reed Kathy Priestner a former speed skater and Ken Reed the former skier brought in um, the carried in the torch into the stadium and handed it to a little girl who then uh, who then lit the cauldron and uh, the price tag back then was 40 million dollars now I think we're going back to speed skating so we'll get a visual of the 500 meter start line and we do thank you Dustin so now here we are We'll talk more about the Oval and other topics as the weekend goes on when we have breaks. So on the left side of your screen on the outer lane is Joshua Hathaway representing Alberta. And then Bon Lowe is from Saskatchewan. So Bon is in the blue outfit and Joshua is in the green and black outfit. Now they cross over on the back stretch. Not Joshua did not use it must have been fairly close because sometimes the skaters can use uh, the other the, the lead skater as a bit of a draft it can help anyway Joshua Hathaway is leading the charge in this race he, he started in the outer lane he'll finish in the inner lane 3902 is what we'd like to see let's have a look in terms of time so Hathaway in at 39 53 and Bon Low in at 38 uh, 14 and for low uh, that's just the time no PB no personal best and no season's best there I was looking hard for them in these two skaters and I couldn't couldn't find them Yeah, I was talking about the Oval. The price tag to build this beautiful facility, it's a grandiose facility if you've never been in it. I know that the new facilities are more current in terms of technology, uh, but they're, they're smaller in stature on the inside. But when you walk into the Calgary Oval, it still, and if you've never been here before, uh, you could still be in awe of the size of this magnificent building, which is adjacent or really just part of the University of Calgary campus but 40 million dollars was the price tag now just to compare uh, with the ice ribbon which is which is the the Beijing venue is called the National Speed Skating uh, Oval but they're gonna call it the ice ribbon so you may as well get in sync now the ice ribbon and speaking of the ice looks like they're fixing uh, some more ice here down the back stretch um, but the ice ribbon in Beijing, uh, the price tag there is uh, probably closer to $200 million. Although no one's talking and no one's acknowledging it. The budget was around $180 million. But you know and I know if you've done any renovations around your house, you come out with a budget, but you never stick to the budget. It's generally over budget and it takes longer. So the Beijing, Beijing Olympics, Beijing Olympics in the first couple of weeks of February, uh, the venue where the speed skating will happen will be called the ice ribbon the ice ribbon and speed and and unlike other sports where some just have dedicated weeks speed skating will be uh, going on for the entire olympics from the start to the finish we're just waiting for further ice repairs so let me um, let me welcome you if you've joined us on the YouTube feed. Um, if uh, you didn't have a vo uh, somebody like me giving a bit of voice and bringing life to the YouTube feed or some music, which we can't really do, uh, it'd be a very quiet experience for you. And uh, you know the most important thing is to to watch speed skating if you love it, and of course support your your family and or your friends. And you can watch it from all over the world. So I'd be curious to know uh, of all those that are plugged in and watching the feed. Where might they be? Those are the top eight times so far uh, in the 500 meter men's. I think that they're going to hold, um, but you never know um, with uh, the rest of the pairings. But those are the top the fastest eight times. 35.08 uh, is uh, Christopher Fiola's best time here today for, and he's from Quebec. So he's obviously going to be very happy with that. So this event um, is an international single distance competition. And um, I mentioned earlier, we have athletes from Canada and the U.S., primarily from Canada. Then U.S. makes up the, the next amount. I think there's about a dozen skaters. Uh, but we also have skaters from Romania, uh, Russia, France, uh, Korea, uh, and I think perhaps one China or another country in Asia. Uh, this is not a selection event, so no points are given to the skater. Uh, to the skaters on the Canadian ranking system. 
And this is an event that spans three days. So this is day one of three. And there's different distances each day. So in this day, you're going to be watching or they'll be participating in 500 meters. And then the 1,000 meters later uh, and later uh, or in the early afternoon. And then we'll cap off the day with the 3,000 meter uh, women's race. And then tomorrow, tomorrow you'll have the 1,000 meters for the men and women, uh, the men's 5,000, and then always a fun and entertaining mass start uh, with the women. The men's mass start will be on uh, Sunday. And then on Sunday, you'll have the 500 meter in the, in the most grueling distance in the sport of speed skating, the 1,500 meters. And then as I mentioned, we'll finish off the mass start with the men's to conclude the three-day event. So we're back in action to watch the 26th pairing of the 500 meter men's race in the inner lane on the right side of your screen is Daniel Pauly and he's from Saskatchewan not wearing Saskatchewan colors in his skin suit but that is a Saskatchewan um, athlete and then we've got Austin Carlson from the United States welcome to Canada so Pauly in the right Carlson on the left and they're going to switch sides switch lanes when they cross the line in the 500 meters now in the opening 100 meters, Carlson in at 10.6, Paulie in at 10.68. Their best times are 38.37 for Paulie and 38.93 for Carlson. Those are both. So let's see how they do. Maybe you can hear the screaming in the background from the fans. It looks like we've got Carlson crossing uh, the line first, and he's going to do so at a time of 38. 58 and that's just off his uh, season's best Carlson in a 38 93 sorry 38 87 and that is a season's best let me say that one more time Daniel Pauli in at 38 87 and Carlson in a 38 58 and both of those times are just off their season's best there I got it correct the second time Okay, this is pairing number 27 on the left. Love the skin suit. That's Andrew Love from the United States. And it's an impressive looking skin suit. Logan Toblin from Alberta on the right side. Down the straightaway they go. I wonder if this is, if this is the new skin suit, the Bio Racer skin suit from Alberta off the production line and on to the Alberta athletes. Looks good. Also with the new logo as each of the provinces change uh, their names uh, to speed skating and then the name of their province. And Toblin crosses uh, the line uh, at a time of 39.23 and Andrew Love from the United States at So that was Logan Toblin and Andrew Love. Andrew Love gets full marks for the nicest looking skin suit of the competition so far. Very impressive. And welcome uh, Austin uh, to Canada for the meet and all your American friends. We'd love to have you up here. We look forward to the pandemic leaving uh, our lives uh, at some the sooner rather than later so we can go back and forth with the greater ease prior to perhaps what it was like before the pandemic showed up. But we're getting some movement now. So welcome back uh, to Canada for the Can-Am International. So this is the 28th pairing. What you see is uh, Jared Farquharson on in the inner lane uh, in the blue outfit from Alberta and uh, Luca Veeman from Saskatchewan. So these are easy to spot. Blue for Alberta, green for Saskatchewan. So opener for Farquharson at 10.64, Veeman at 10.72. Here we go, down the back stretch. We got Farquharson who started in the inner lane, will finish in the outer. He'd love to best his time of 38.88. Uh, he crosses the line 
at a time of 3870 and he can book that in his resume as a personal and a season's best. Luca Veeman crosses the line at 3922 and he can also book that on his speed skating resume as a personal best by 1 100ths of a second. Well done, Luca Veeman and well done Jared Farkason. We've got a couple Saskatchewan athletes on the start of this 29th pairing. Keegan uh, Waddington is in the inside lane. So he's wearing the orange and the black. It looks like orange and black to me anyway, maybe a bit of red. And Liam Delaire from also representing Saskatchewan, and he's wearing the Saskatchewan colors. Maybe I'll talk a little bit about the armbands too uh, at some point because that's now a piece of equipment that the athletes are now responsible for, and that's an... ISU regulation that started last year that has now come to reality this year. And this is the first race these athletes have had to go and get their own armbands. All of them, all the ones they received, the various colors have been free, but from here on in, they have to pay for them. It's their responsibility. It has nothing to do with lack of volunteers. The, this is an ISU regulation. So you heard it from me. I don't know, first or second, uh, but to squash any rumors that maybe there's a shortage of volunteers is just not the case. So we got Waddington finishing off in the inside lane, and uh, he finishes off a time with a time of 39.25, and that is just off his season's best, and Liam Delaire at 39.38, and he's going to be happy with that because that's both a personal best and a season's best for him. You can always tell when they get a good time because they'll high five or low five or mid five their coach down the back stretch. Back stretch. In this 30th pairing, we've got Caleb Jacobson on the right side and Ian from Alberta and Ian McPeak from Manitoba on the left side. So Ian is bearing the black and the yellow and you've got Caleb Jacobson wearing the orange and the black. These races are very similar in times. They're just over around 39 and a half ish is around their personal and season's best. They're coming out the final corner right now. And it looks like Jacobson is going to cross the line first, and he does so. And he does so at a time of a 39 even. And he'll be happy with that because that's a personal and a season's best for Caleb. Ian McPeak in at 39.52. And he barely squeaks in on his season's best by 11 one hundredths of a second and does so. So that's a season's best and a personal best for both Caleb Jacobson and Ian McPeak. Congratulations, gentlemen. We are in pairing number three. We got the Battle of the United States of America. I'm sure I'm sure they've traveled together. Uh, we've got Matthew Salm um, from uh, the, in the inner lane, so he'll be wearing the black skin suit. Matthew Salm on the right side, and Caden Barber. Caden Barber in the outer lane, and he's in the blue skin suit. So. Their, their times are just in the 39 to 40 range, their personal best and season's best. So we want to see them, we want to see them uh, get close, if not exceed them. So Matthew Somm on the right in the black and Caden Barber in the outer lane. And in the opening 100 meters. 10.77 for Somm and 11.07 for Barber. So uh, here comes Somm. He's going to cross the line first. He's in the black uh, skin suit, so he finishes at a time of 38.61. 
Uh, and at 38.61, he's going to be, if he's not enthusiastic or ecstatic about that time, uh, he should be because that's a personal best. And look at that. He, he, he can, um, I met him earlier, actually. I had a good chat with him briefly and uh, just I wanted to check his pronunciation of his name. Uh, and then you got Caden uh, Barber. At, uh, his PB, rather, season, season's best is 40.45. He comes in at 40.8. Anyway, congratulations, Matthew Somm from the United States of America. Welcome to Canada. We've got some, we've got a Battle of Manitoba. We've got Ryan Kulbaki in the inner lane. And he... And he's got a time of uh, 39.02. He'll be looking to best that for a personal best. And Ethan Vandenberg at 40.22. Both are uh, from Manitoba, and I know a little bit more about these skaters than I do others because I'm watching them grow up uh, in the speed skating world. Ryan Kobaki is a very good short track speed skater. That is his love. But at this stage of their careers... Uh, they, uh, Ryan Quebec, and you'll see this from Adam Buckwald as well. Uh, they'll race long track and short track until they actually zero in on one particular discipline. Doesn't hurt to do both at this stage. Quebec is in the inside lane, and then you got Ethan Vandenberg. Ethan Vandenberg skates very little because his passion is biking, so he's in incredible shape. Uh, and we should see a very good time from Ethan. His last 500 meters was 40.23. So I'd be very surprised uh, if we don't see, well, both of these skaters uh, challenge their season and or their personal bests. Very likable, very good kids. Uh, and Manitoba is proudly represented with these two skaters. Here comes uh, Vandenberg down the back stretch. Uh, he, uh, Ethan had an opening time of 10 75 he crosses a line at 38 72 and he obliterates his personal best and that's no surprise given the last time he raced had Kobaki in at 39 51 and I've got to double check uh, to see where that lands on his personal best because I can't read my writing sorry Ryan I'll be back on that one but Ethan Vandenberg a season and a personal best uh, for him Starters are wasting no time. So we've got uh, we've got Fergus English from Saskatchewan, and we've got Eric Holheim uh, representing uh, Alberta. Okay, here comes Fergus English, and he's going to uh, finish his time of this race at 39.59, and that'll be a personal best for him. And Eric Holheim in at 40.33, and that'll be a personal best for him as well. So these guys have done extremely well. Congratulations for that. I'm checking Ryan Kulbaki's, uh personal best is at 39.62. And I'll just see how he finished this race. Ryan Kobaki did a time of 39.51. And so Ryan Kobaki also achieved a personal best. And as I thought, they would both do it. And they did. And congratulations to Ryan Kobaki. In the inside lane of this 34th pair, and you got Ben Rutledge uh, in the uh, yellow rather the yeah the yellow and black outfit with the white armband but i more identify with the the skin suits themselves and in the black outfit is phoenix bauma and so ben rutledge is from manitoba bauma is from ontario both are very evenly matched skaters in terms of their times they should be because they came in with the pairings of their seatings that'll change but rutledge is going to finish his 500 meters first he'll want to best his time of 40 31 and he comes in at a time of 40.48, just off his personal best. Bauman at, at 41.32. So unfortunately, we don't have a season or a personal best here from these skaters.
Okay, we have 40 pairings of the men's 500 meters. I'm looking at a 500 meter start line right now, and I don't see two skaters there, but let me introduce them. Here they come. Um, in the green outfit is Christopher Veeman. The Veeman family is, uh, well, Christopher would be the uh, father, so let's just call him Chris Veeman. Met him earlier. Uh, Luca and Miko Veeman are his sons. He has three, and. Um, and uh, he, uh, two of them are skating along with uh, dad. Uh, very impressive. So Christopher Veeman, I guess, would be his driver's license name, library name, maybe his medical card name, but let's call him Chris Veeman. Nice guy. Uh, this, in this pairing, uh, it's just him. We have a uh, scratch from Vishwerja, Vishwerja Jadilia uh, from India, who is not racing. So... Let's have a look at Veeman's time. Veeman's coming in at 11.80. 11 Love the fact that uh, uh, the fathers are skating. Inspirational. Maybe one day I'll put on the long blades. Never know what can happen. I'm, uh, I'm used to playing hockey and refereeing it in, in my career. But Chris, uh, in my journey, <laughs> in, but Chris, Chris's personal best is 41.65. He'll be looking uh, to best that or get close to it. And he is going to cross the line at a time of 42.42. So we'll book that in for him as a season's best time for Chris Veeman, the father of Mika, Miko, and Luca from Saskatchewan. Well done, Chris. We're in the 36th pairing, and we have um, an international skater in the inside lane, Yu Sing Kao, and he's from Taipei. And uh, he's going to finish off in the outer lane, and he is in the blue and black outfit. And then Jack Hansen is from British Columbia, and he'll finish off in the inside lane. The 500 meters is one and a quarter laps around. First 100 meters is the opening time, and then you hear the bell, and then 400 meters after that. Here comes Yu Sang, and uh, he is going to cross the line at a time of 40-48. Uh, I can't tell you where that stacks up in his personal best or season's best, but Jack Hansen crossed the line at 41-63. And Jack should be happy that with that because that beats his personal best and season's best by 25 one hundredths of a second. In the 37th pairing, from your vantage point, watching on the YouTube feed on the left, you've got Brock Gilbert from Alberta in uh, the blue and the black outfit. Sorry, he's on the right side in what looks like the Canadian outfit. Brock Gilbert in the right side. And then you've got Alan Tsai from the United States of America and in the outer lane. He's in the blue. So, Gilbert will finish off in the outer lane, Tsai in the inner lane. Alberta versus, well, let's say Canada versus the U.S. in this 37th pairing matchup here in the Can-Am International Long Track uh, Speed Skating Competition. Tsai almost fell on that final turn. Uh, that's not often. He'll lose, he'll lose some time on that and see if he can make it up. Hard to do, but very evenly matched uh, skaters. So they cross the line. Um, Alan Tsai from the States at 40.37. Now he's going to be happy with that uh, time because that beats his personal best by virtually two seconds. Uh, and then Brock uh, Gilbert at 40.42. And he gets a personal and a season best out of this race as well. So two good races for these racers who are early in the development of them uh, as speed skaters. Okay, the 38th pairing, we've got Adam Buckwald um, from Manitoba. And he starts with an opening uh, time of 
and Liam McKegg from Saskatchewan. Adam, like Ryan Kilbacki, is a short track. His he prefers short track. Change trains on short track and is a very very good skater. Very beautiful to watch. And um, but I think he also is intrigued by long track. Plus, I believe he's going to be skating the 5,000 meters. God bless him or any other skaters who wants to skate those kinds of distances. But Buckwald has a personal best uh, up until today of, a, of a 41.27, and he obliterated that and came under 40 seconds. He's going to be very happy with that time. 39.79 for Buckwald as a PB. And Liam McKegg crosses the line at 41.76. He's also going to be happy with that time uh, because he obliterated... Um, uh, that time at 40, uh, 43.10. So both of these guys, both of these skaters had personal best and season's best of this year. So great. Congratulations, Adam, and congratulations, Liam. Okay, in this 39th pairing, the second last of our, um, of our 500 meter men's races, we've got Aaron Reel. Aaron Reel from Manitoba. Um, he is skating by himself, tough. You know, if the ice is slow and doesn't have another skater pushing him. So just an extra challenge mentally uh, to push himself physically. 41.75 is a, is a time he's going to have. He and his coach and his family are going to have an eye on. And let's see how he does here. He crosses the line at 42.24. 40 just over. So we'll book that in as just over his uh, personal and season's uh, best which he would have had uh, earlier this year, uh, probably in September. And we have a couple of uh, senior statesmen on the start line. Uh, pairing number 40, the last pairing. So we got Bob Irvin. Bob Irvin, um, I talked to him earlier. He just loves skating. He's about, uh, well, he's about, 67, 68 years old. He's a father of five. Uh, Kaylin Irvin is a uh, on the national. His daughter's on the the national speed skating team as a sprinter and is currently over in Nor Norway right now. Uh, she'll be competing in uh, all of the uh, World Cups uh, along with Heather McLean uh, and a and a, n a host of other racers. And, um, and so we've got Bob Irvine, and then we've got Robert Black. And uh, let's have a look at their times. So Bob Irvine crosses the line at 44. Uh, he's going to be happy with that time because that's a season's best for him. So he can still get better. Obviously, he's thinking that. Robert Black from Australia at 45.97. Well off his personal best. Well, we'll book that in for his season's best. So... All my friends out there in YouTube land, there's the top eight times in the 500-meter men's race. Fiola in from Quebec at 35.08. Tellez in at 35.4 for number two fastest time. And Anders Johnson uh, rounding out the second and third British Columbia position at 35.6. So that concludes the first part and day one first part of the Can-Am International race. And if you're listening to it on YouTube, just want to tell you we've had some technical issues audio issues especially inside the oval there is no announcing going on it is quiet as a mouse unless you're on the youtube feed which is usually the opposite because if you're listening or watching the youtube it's very very quiet and um, but the idea is to bring both the youtube feed and also uh the oval to life through commentating and announcing but we'll see if we can rectify this as the meet goes on so the time right now in Alberta is 12.14. Unless I'm told differently, um, we are now going to have an ice resurfacing and we're going to come back at 12.50 or 10 to 1. And... Okay, so the current time right now is 12.15. We're going to do ice resurfacing at 12.35.
and we're going to resume the races at 1 p.m. We'll be 10 minutes off to our draft schedule time. I think that probably has something to do with uh, uh, a number of falls that have occurred and that they want to check out the ice uh, to make sure it's in top shape for uh, the 1,000-meter women and men's races coming up. And following that, we'll have the 3,000-meter um, women's races. So I'm officially going to go quiet on you, and I'll be back with uh, a gentleman by the name of Simon Coots, uh, and he's going to join me um, uh, ahead of the 1,000-meter races, and uh, we're going to have a good chat uh, about anything and everything related to the sport of speed skating, including his, his own career. See you soon. Listen to you soon as well. Listen to me. Testing, testing, one, two, testing. Testing, testing, one, two, testing.
Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, 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 one, two, three. It's 12.23. It's 12.23. At 12.35, we're going to have a nice resurfacing. At 1 o'clock, we're going to start the 1,000 meters.
Testing, testing, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, test, test, test. Testing, testing, one, two, three, testing. Hello, testing. Twelve thirty four. Testing one to twelve thirty four here at the Calgary Oval. Twelve thirty four here at the Calgary Oval. Testing the microphone out up here in the timing deck. Twelve thirty four. The Zamboni is going to be coming on at twelve thirty five. We're going to have one o'clock. We'll have the 1,000 meter women's races, followed by the 3,000 meter women's races, and that'll be capping off day one here at the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition.
Welcome back to the Calgary Oval here in Calgary, Alberta. It's 12.49, 11 minutes to race time. I can't tell whether you can hear me clearly or not, but we're bringing the microphone back on and we're going to announce the rest of the day while we commentate on the YouTube feed. Welcome to the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition. This is some music leading up to the one o'clock start time, the 1,000 meter men's and women's. And you might want to check the YouTube channel, the YouTube feed. Lots of information there. I'm going to be interviewing Simon Coots coming up momentarily. Zamboni, I won't compete with it. I could play some music in the background. One o'clock start. Eight minutes to race time. Bringing back the microphone. We're going to see if the sound is good with the te technical difficulties we've had. We're going to work our way through it. Seven minutes to show time. The 1,000 meter women's race coming up. You know what's next? My favorite song leading up to the one o'clock start. Well, hello out there. I noticed uh, we indicated there'd be a YouTube interview at 12.45, and it's 12.54. I'm nine minutes off my start time, but my guest has arrived. 
Uh, and so I would like to do an interview. So here's what's going to happen this afternoon. So let's see, let me just give you an indication of what's going on in the Oval now. We, I think we've worked through our audio difficulties. And right now the Space Odyssey song is playing inside the Oval, breathing some life to it. We've got about six minutes to showtime. Uh, one o'clock start for the 1,000 meter uh, uh, races. We're starting with the women. Uh, there is 16 pairings uh, for the women and 10 uh, for the men for the first for the first part, and then they'll do an ice resurfacing. And then there's a uh, there's 33 pairing uh, pairings in the men's. Uh, in total. So this is going to take us for the next couple hours uh, for the 1,000 meter race. It's very exciting. Looking forward to it. So it's 12.55 and one of the things that we wanted to do is breathe a little life into your YouTube experience so you're just not watching a couple skaters go round and round and it's really just quiet because you can't hear the music because we can't play you music because it's against the, the YouTube police would, would penalize us in some fashion. The worst thing they could do is is uh, shut us down. The best thing is, uh, the next worst thing is probably say we have to pay royalties. So we're just not going there. So we're breathing life into your YouTube experience here at the Can Am International event uh, through words and guests. So today we have one of the uh, uh, speed skaters that's been out from uh, in the Oval program and uh, been going to university, University of Calgary for a number of years. His name is Simon Coots. Uh, so uh, Simon uh, has been skating. Well, we're going to learn a little bit about Simon's career. But this is the first time Simon has actually been, or maybe the second time in all the years, um, uh, that Simon's been out in Calgary up in the timing deck. So Simon, just press that button for the microphone. Let me first welcome you and thank you for taking the time to sit down with me to talk a little bit about your career and about speed skating in general. Hello, Simon. Uh, hey, Greg, and uh, thanks for having me on. So... Is it, is it, how many years have you been out in the Calgary Oval in terms of uh, this, this, since you left Manitoba? This would be my sixth year in the program. So I think I moved out 2015. So you're how old now? I'm 26 years old. Okay, so let's, uh, I guess the first place I want to start is, is for those that don't know you, let's get them to know you. Okay, so you were born and raised where? Um, I was born in Guelph, but at a young age, moved to Winnipeg, and that's where I was raised, and that's where I grew up speed skating. Okay, and so uh, I know your parents because I'm related to your parents, and you're related to me, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But without having a speed skating family, at least in that generation, what was your connection to the sport? How did you first get into it? Uh, at a young age, my mom signed me up when I was in uh, early grade school, and I was kind of in and out of the sport for a while, but by the time I got to the middle years, grade 7, grade 8, I started really liking it and kind of stuck with it, and it's been a part of my life ever since. Usually young Canadian boys grow up and play hockey. Where was hockey in that whole journey? Uh, my dad put me in hockey when I was three or four. I think I lasted about one season, so short-lived. So speed skating appealed to you with no other influence. Your aunt uh, uh, was also heavily involved in speed skating. And uh, did that influence you at all? Honestly, not that I know of. It wasn't until uh, I'd been in skating for a while that I even knew that she was formerly a skater herself, both her and my uncle. Okay, so in, in uh, so you, you strapped on the long blades early. Uh, what were some of your earlier experiences? Uh, uh, and, and, where did, and what club did you skate on? If I want to spend a little time on your career. I'm going to have to pause in a moment to introduce the skaters uh, coming up. But, um, but tell me a little bit about the start. So I skated for the River Heights Speed Skating Club in Winnipeg, uh, one of the more successful clubs probably across the country with a lot of famous Winnipeg and Manitoba skaters coming out of there. Um, skated there for a while and then with them and also the provincial team until I was about 20 years old and then moved my skating career out to Calgary. Who were some of the famous people or well-known skaters out of the club that you skated out of? Um, everyone's favorite uh, skater, Iron Mike Ireland. Yeah, it was the Iron, <laughs> who had a great career at the, at the world level, at the Olympic level, and now is the coach out in Alberta. Yeah, coaching one of the the Stage 3 Oval program here uh, quite successfully so far. So maybe we can talk about the stages in a sec. So you moved out here to go to school, correct? 
Yeah, it was a mix. I wasn't going to come out if I wasn't skating. I wasn't going to come out if I wasn't also at the University of Calgary. So once I was accepted into both programs, then it was a go. So did you have to have certain qualifying times for the Oval to accept you as a speed skater in their program? Yes, but they're not not—they're not unreasonable, and they'll take pretty much anyone who's willing to pursue and is passionate about it and is at a, at least the minimum level, which is... You know, kind of, a lot of provincial team skaters can make it quite easily. Okay, so you've been here six years, right? So you've been, and you've been going to school for those six years? That is correct, yeah. I've been at the UFC this whole time. So what, uh, tell me a little bit about the education that you've pursued. What will you end up with? And then what kind of career will you pursue? Will it be connected with the education that you get, or will it be something different? Uh, so I finished my um, bachelor's in anthropology in twenty. 19 and then moved on to a master's in anthropology program that I'm still working through now and as for as a career goes who knows so when you come out to Calgary and part of the speed skating program what what, what so you had been a 18 years old at, at the I was, time I was 20 at the time so well, you were, oh, so you're older, 20 at the time I just finished my last year of junior and I came out when I was first year neo senior so what did you do from ages 18 to 20 did you go to school in Manitoba yeah, I was at the University of Winnipeg for two years and then transferred my credits over to come to UFC. I see. Okay. And so then, so then when you become part of the program, um, then what happens after that? Do you have an, is there a certain path that they want you to take? How, what, what, how do they take you under your wing? What's, what's the plan? For the Oval program? Yeah. So basically the way it's laid out is they have stages um, two through kind of five, which is getting up towards the national team level. And the idea is that a lot of people come in, like myself, in stage two, make it into stage three eventually, where you're with a slightly older group, faster group. Um, and then uh, over the years, ideally, you know, eventually you make it into stage four on the national team as a train partner or as an actual national team athlete. Uh, there's different ways to get around, but uh, the main trend for most skaters is generally upwards. So then how, how would you assess your – how would you assess – um, your career in terms of how it's gone. Did you reach the, you, you've been at it and well, actually we're going to pause for a second because we're going to turn to the oval and we're going to introduce some of the skaters and we're going to talk as the races uh, move through. So we're talking with Simon Coots, who's from Winnipeg, Manitoba, who's a senior skater out here in Calgary and he's competing in the Can-Am International, but it's his day off. So he had a workout, uh, a bite to eat, and uh, now he's going to spend about an hour with us before, what, a second workout? Yeah, I train twice a day most days. Okay, so we've started the 1,000 meters here in the Can-Am and the ladies in the inside lane uh, from Alberta will be Anna Bourgeois. Uh, she's in the blue outfit. She'll start in the inner, uh, inner lane and finish in the outer lane. Ilsa Shob from the United States is in the outer lane. I'm going to take a moment, and I'm going to announce uh, this at the oval level. We're back with the microphone live announcing. I'm toggling back and forth between the oval announcing and commentary on YouTube. If you're following, this is pair one of 13 in the 1,000 meter race. Anna Bourgeois in the inner lane will finish in the inner lane from Alberta and Ilsa Schaub in the outer lane and will finish in the outer lane from the United States of America. Anna's opening time, 19.94. Ilsa Schaub, 21.03 with 400 meters to go. Okay, as we watch these racers, how hard is the 1,000 meters? What, what, what's the strategy of somebody who's racing the 1,000? It, it's not the same as the 500 and not the same as the 5,000, but what are you thinking about at the start line? Uh, it's, it is pretty similar to the 500. I mean, it's kind of just guns blazing, go, go, go. You do, there is an element of trying to relax into it because it is a much longer distance in the sense that it's twice as long, so trying to hold on is much more difficult. While Bourgeois crosses the line at a time at 121.06, Il show at 126.22. Uh, Neither uh, get close to their season's best or their personal best. Ice is a bit slower uh, right now. Uh, maybe Simon, talk a little bit about that uh, because it's, it's a little slower than uh, I would say from the times that I've seen, especially from uh, the Long Track Championships and uh, the Oval International about a month ago. What's going on? Yeah, so day to day and month to month, ice conditions change quite a bit. Right now in Calgary, we have some colder weather coming through, minus 10, one of the week lows so far at this point. So generally with cold weather, 
you see uh, ice conditions kind of drop off a bit and you don't have the, quite the low pressure coming in that you'd like to see for faster ice. So weather does have an impact on the skaters' times? Without a doubt, even with indoor ovals. All right, I'm going to head to the actual oval and breathe some life into it. We're in the second pairing of the 1,000 meters in the inner lane. Uh, we have from the United States of America, Sydney Turpinine. And in the outer lane, also from the United States, the Battle of the Americans, we got Blair Crookshank. Inner and outer, where they start is where they'll finish. Crookshank's opening time is 18.81. Turpinine in at 20.79. Back to the YouTube feed if you happen to be paying attention. I would be doing both if I were you inside the oval as well. So... Crookshank, Blair Crookshank is the daughter of Blair, of uh, Bonnie Blair and Dave Crookshank. And, um, and I believe Bonnie Blair is in the house. I look forward to having an opportunity to speak with her if she gets a chance. Uh, if she gets a chance, I think she's also coaching here as well. And Sydney Turpening is uh, also from the States. And let's just, just have a look at their, uh, their personal best. Crookshank's looking at just a time of 120 and Turpinin at 124. Let's see how they make. They're coming down the straightaway. Here comes uh, Crookshank and she's going to cross. Crookshank's going to cross the line at 121, a 98. And uh, Turpinin is at 126.80. So neither of them get close to their season's best. Again, kind of what we're talking about in terms of the, uh, to the, terms of the slow ice. So we were talking about your career. I want to go back to your career. And, you know, when you arrive out here as a 20-year-old, what are your expectations? Do you want to go to the Olympic? Is it, is it every speed skater's dream to come out to the Oval? Okay, I'll train and go to the Olympics and get a gold medal put around my neck. Or is that a realistic expectation? Um, what does one think about when they arrive here? And, and, and how is your expectation of your career and your career matched up? And before you answer that, let me introduce these two skaters. This is the third pairing in the 1,000 meter race in the inner lane. From British Columbia, we got Brooke Braun. And then from the outer lane, from the United States of America, Gia Griffith. Brooke Braun's opening time is 21.22. Griffiths in at 20.39. Back to the YouTube feed. Okay, can you run with that? Do you remember the question? <laughs> yeah, I think I got it. Yeah, I think a lot of people when they come out, you know, there's a quite wide range. Some people come out for fun. For some, some people, it's an excuse to get out of your hometown or home province, experience something different. Some people, a lot of people do want to pursue at the higher level, World Cups, World Championships, uh, Olympic dreams are pretty common. You know, for myself, it was kind of a mix of all of them. You never really know where it will take you. When you're 20, you're still pretty young for a skater, so you don't know really how your career will go at that point. Um, obviously at this point with the way things are going, you know, it's been a good run, but something like the Olympics, you have to be at the absolute top of your game. And that's not realistic for most people, but uh, yeah, you know, it's, there's a lot of different reasons to come out to somewhere like Calgary and join the, the oval program to start skating. So Griffiths crosses the line at a time of one twenty-five. And uh, she's going to be happy with that because that's a personal best for her. And Brooke Braun at 128.6 and off her season's best. The... Um, okay, so, so what... So when you look back, you've been skating now for probably, what, 15 years, Simon? Yeah, I'd say somewhere around that, uh, that length of time. Yeah, so are you closer, you must be closer to the end of the career. And, and so when you reflect back, um, uh, you must have met a lot of great people in the sport. You must have done some wonderful traveling and you've pushed your body to some physical limits that normally us, us folk don't get a chance to do. 
Absolutely, yeah. Those are all uh, very true. You know, you come out, you're with a bunch of like-minded people in the program. You get to skate at many different ovals, different countries, different parts of Canada. Um, it, you know, it, there's so many benefits to, to you know, pursuing sport throughout your, your younger years, for sure. Let me go back to the oval for a moment. So we've got in this race in the fourth pairing in the inner lane, which will finish in the inner lane, we've got Rebecca Simmons representing the United States. And Kellyanne Friesen from Saskatchewan. That is the bell lap. Kellyanne Friesen has a personal best of 127.33, and Simmons is at 127.79 for a PB. So let's see how these racers do. I'm toggling back and forth right now at the Oval, as well as in YouTube. I'm interviewing Simon Coots if you want to get on the YouTube feed. Here comes Rebecca Simmons, beautiful speed skating outfit, and she crosses uh, the line at a time of 124.64, and Callie Ann Friesen at a time of 127.25. She'll happy, be happy with that time, as that is a personal best. Okay, Simon, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I want to talk a little bit about the kind of training that goes into uh, d developing a speed skater. My sense is when I was in school, I could cram for exams and, uh, you know, get by. But I, I, if I wanted to become a speed skater, I can't cram in a, pa pa in a package of a certain number of years to become an elite speed skater like you and your, 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 your peers. It's a, it's a progress in shaping and developing a speed skater. And can you walk me through a little bit about some of the training and some of the, um, the, the programs that help shape you to get to the level you are? Yeah, absolutely, Greg. And, you know, it's, it is, you're right in the sense that Unlike an exam where you can cram maybe for your midterms in university, it does take a lo much longer time to develop the fitness, the base, uh, the, the kind of technical skills that you need uh, to become a, skate, a speed skater at an elite level. So a lot of the training that we do is actually off ice, a lot of dry land, um, running and biking, weightlifting. These are the things that help you build your strength a lot of the time over the summer and throughout the season as well, but to a bit of a lesser extent. And then, you know, the, the technique, the skating, the ice time that you do through the winter, that's, that's obviously mandatory too, but that's only part of the puzzle. And you kind of have to put it all together. And for a lot of skaters, you know, it's in your 30s that you'll kind of come into your prime and things really start clicking. Are you saying 30? Okay, well, I want to touch on that in a second, but let me go to the oval for a moment. The two skaters that are skating around the oval right now, we've got a Romanian, Deanna, Andre, and Nastasia. Uh, in the inner lane, she'll finish off in the inner lane. And Cynthia Jennings from the United States of America, they're heading down the back stretch, and obviously they're going to be looking to be focused uh, on their uh, on their times, on their personal bests. And here they come. Okay, Deanna Andre, uh, her season's best is one twenty seven seventy one. And she's going to be happy with that time because she did a 126.38 and Cynthia Jennings at 127.36 and above her PB. That's a personal best for Deanna at 126.38. Okay, but when I think of a speed skater, I think of but, you know, I think of the olden days, the Gaetan Bouchers of the world where they were thick and they were looked sprinter-like, but the, 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 the shape and size of today's speed skaters are much leaner uh, and, and they're more all-round um, uh, conditioned athletes for, the various, for, for not just one distance. And so what kind of training goes into that? It would be all kinds of training. Um, cycling, you know, at this point in the season, I can almost guarantee at the World Cup circuit, a lot of those skaters, if not all of them, have spent more time on the bike than they have on their skates this year. So, you know, that's that's one way where you really stay in shape, you build strength, you build your base. Um, it's not just about lifting weights and being big and strong. You know, you have to be efficient as well. And it's just the way with that sports science gone in the last 10, 20, 30 years, being the biggest and the strongest doesn't make you the fastest. You know, it's you are pushing body weight. It is heavier to hold hard weight around the corners. You have a lot of pressure. So being lightweight and efficient, but still fairly strong for your size is still a very uh, a good way to approach trying to be a fast skater. 
All right, we'll come back to that in a moment. Right to the oval for a moment. We have the next two skaters. And actually, I think I'll leave my microphone on for also the YouTubers, and I'll do both. Um, in the sixth pairing in the 1,000 meter, uh, meter women's races from the United States, Ellie Fuchs in the inner lane, and that's how she'll finish. And in the outer lane, we've got Sylvie Lloyd, and she's from British Columbia. As they round the final turn to the back stretch, these two, these two skaters are giving it all they got to finish up. And in crossing the line. Oh, I just don't have. Sylvie Lloyd crosses the line at 129.58 and Fuchs in at 130.03. So, Simon, how has the pandemic affected um, the speed skaters in terms of the co competitive times? They've been really, other than this fall, and maybe if you're fortunate enough to be in the bubble back in Europe in uh, earlier this year, uh, it's been mostly training. It's been dryland training. It's been training probably by Zoom. Um, and very little competition. How do you think that's affected? And, and, and people are two years older in a lot of cases, depending on where your age, age is. How's that affected? How do you think in general it's affected the speed skaters? I mean, it definitely affects everyone differently. Some people really took the kind of, you guys could call it a very long off season to get stronger, get a stronger base, you know, really dial in. Some people struggled to keep focus. Some people just didn't have quite the train environment that was perfect. I know here in Calgary, we had the, the unfortunate reality is that we lost our oval for last season as well due to technical problems. So we didn't have ice here. So, you know, commuting out and back and forth to Red Deer to go to long track ice was an option sometimes, but you can't always give up that kind of time and energy. So it, it becomes much more difficult. A lot of training alone, a lot of training with small groups, with roommates, one or two teammates. Um, you know, you make the most of it, but different people definitely handle it uh, in different ways. So would one think that if you had a two-year layoff and you didn't compete, but you spent time uh, getting stronger, that you would have faster times? But that's not the case, is it? Not at all. And some people, you know, some people stayed focused and worked hard all year. And right now they're still struggling to get back into it because having a year without uh, consistent training on ice, dialing in technique, honing your skills, you know, it's that's a challenge nonetheless. So it might still be another year or two until some of this work comes to fruition for a lot of skaters. All right, let's turn our focus back to the oval for a moment. And on the o on the ice right now, representing uh, Alberta is Alina Manina, who will finish off in the outer lane, and Grace Reynoldson from Saskatchewan in the um, uh, in the. No, let me get this straight. Alina Manina <laughs> crosses the line at 131.25, and she's going to be happy with that because that. Best her personal best by a long shot and Grace Reynoldson in at 135.58 and that's also a season's best for Gracie. Okay, in case, in, in case you are just joined us, we're in Calgary, Alberta. We're at the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition. It's a single distance uh, uh, competition over three days. Today we have the 500 meter, 1000 meter men's and women's and the 3000 meter women's race uh, later today. Uh, right now we are in the eighth pairing of the 1000 meter race. Uh, we've got Antonio Villa. Um, on the left side of the screen, she's in the uh, yellow and black, and Sophia Dvorak, and, and Antonio's representing Manitoba. Sophia Dvorak is rep representing, representing Sus Saskatchewan. This is primarily a, a development, Simon, this is primarily a developmental meet. We've got some senior skaters like you and uh, some national team skaters. Uh, for example, Abigail McCluskey has come back from Poland. She'll be, I think she's racing, a, a, well, she raced this morning, actually, the 500 um, let's talk about uh, the skaters that are um, 
that aren't here right now that are in the World Cup in Norway. Um, uh, th- there's four World Cups leading up to the Olympics. Uh, we just had one in recently in um, uh, uh, Poland, and now this one in Norway. Um, how is how is Canada faring relative to the other countries? I watched a little bit on the weekend, and boy, there's some really countries posting some very low times. Are we going to be able to hold our own here? Is that maybe that's a loaded question? So be careful how you answer that. Yeah, I'd say uh, Canada's off to a strong start this year. Picked up a couple medals in Poland, and even just. Earlier today in Norway, Isabel Weidman picked up another silver medal in the women's five kilometer race. So shout out to her. Um, I think, you know, we have a fairly young team now, but we still have that kind of older core group that's strong, that has a lot of experience, that's been in the World Cup for a while. So it's a good mix, uh, a lot of talent this year. I think the, the last four, maybe even eight years, uh, Species Canada has really been developing a strong team that's kind of coming up to a point where they're actually competitive in the A group at World Cups. So I'm looking forward to the rest of the season, but I see it uh, going going well throughout the entire year, and especially, you know, with the Olympics this year uh, in February. It's going to be a big, big, big time for Team Canada. But what other countries are, cre- are, are, are advancing, are, are growing and developing uh, world-class speed skaters? I would think that China would be because they are uh, hosting the Olympics, and generally a host country throws a lot of money and resources at the, at, at the sports that are in those Olympics um, because they want to see their host country athletes do well. That is uh, that's exactly right, Greg. You know, Team China historically has had good years and bad years of skaters, and I'd say this year is one of those times where they're really stepping their game up. Uh, they put a lot of money and time into developing a team this Olympic cycle for the home Olympics in Beijing this coming February. And, uh, you know, last year they only had a handful of, or sorry, two seasons ago, only a handful of skaters that were really uh, making on the big stage. And then at the first World Cup this year, they have 11 top 10 finishes and two medals to their name. So very strong start for Team China compared to the previous few seasons. What you're looking at on the screen is the top eight times for the 1,000 meter ladies. Anna Bourgeois laid down the fastest opening time at 121.06. I heard the whistle in the background. We had Antonio Villa unfortunately fall. Um, they fixed the ice or at least take, took a look at it. And now we're moving to pairing number nine. And it's Molly Morris in the inner lane, which would be from she's from Saskatchewan. Uh, you're left on the left on your screen, and Heidi Beck from Alberta on on the right so we're in pairing number nine in the 1000 meters and we're here talking with simon coots a veteran speed skater from manitoba who's been out in calgary going to school is a senior you know sometimes some of the parents ask me greg what's a senior what's a neo senior what's a junior and uh, each of them have a place Uh, and speed skating from and i'm still as a speed skating dad i'm really learning and it just feels kind of complicated at times um and um, but maybe we could maybe you could sort of distill it down into when somebody says, oh, that's a junior skater or that's a neo senior skater or that's a senior skater. What does that mean? And then and then what? And because some of the skaters said they're, they're heading over to uh, Germany for the next couple of weeks to be in a neo senior meet. Maybe. Can you expand on that, please? Yeah, absolutely. So there are three main age categories for speed skating. Junior, which will take you to the age of either 19 or 20. So one or two years out of university. Um, that's kind of like, you know, the, the, pri- the primary developmental stage. World Juniors is an all-around competition that is quite big. Team Canada sends a team of about eight skaters every single year to that and does, you know, historically quite well. Um, and then once you're done junior, though, you kind of, before you really got thrown into, like, what was just called senior, which is just basically everyone else on the world stage grouped into one group. So whether you're 35, 30, or 25, you're all a senior and you're all racing together. Um, but now there's kind of a, a push to develop more of those skaters get stuck in the middle ground, the neo seniors. So age 20 to 23 ish, uh, there's now neo senior world cups that operate at the same time as junior world cups and skaters of this kind of middle age can now compete when they're above the junior level, but not quite on the world stage. Molly Morris crosses the line at 147.14 and, um, Heidi Beckett. Oh. 
okay, so we talked about so so basically the junior, neo, 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 senior, and senior are are pockets of ages at about three, and you are a senior at the age of twenty five. 26, but yes, I'm a senior at this point. And once you're a senior, you're, base, you're a senior until, I guess, the final age group would be master. So once you're 35, most people have uh, retired from their their main skating career at that point. But there are still many uh, masters skaters that compete at uh, so, competitions like world masters. So if I skated, I would be a master senior old person's category? Is that, how does that work? Yeah, I'd be a master, master, you'd be master. A master. And master, they're in groups of five. <laughs> oh, I see. Okay, that's great. Okay, that, that, that helps. And so... Some of the up and coming speed skaters in our country are actually, they would be, like what I noticed about at the long track championships, let me back up for a moment. A lot of the skaters that had the best times were well into their 20s. They're, they're mid, mid to late 20s. That seems to be when a speed skater reaches its peak, yes? Yeah, I, I would say, uh, especially recently, you know, looking at a lot of the, the men's events, you're seeing guys in the 30 to 33 range that are really, uh, you know, coming into their best years. A lot of girls, sometimes a bit younger, but uh, still late 20s, early 30s. Often the top girls in the world are that age. It's not that younger skaters can't be dominant. Some some skaters, you know, they really, they're really strong at a younger age, but the average age is definitely quite a bit higher. Well, and then it's almost like the neo seniors in the early stages. That's when you see these some of these athletes break out. I'm thinking of Alexa Scott, Tyson Langlar, too, and then I see a junior Laura Hall who's 19 and last year of uh, in the junior category. Uh, these are skaters that don't have the same times as maybe their peers do in their mid 20s, but they're showing signs that they're heading in that direction. Absolutely, you know, a lot of the juniors eventually go to neo senior competitions, and the neo seniors eventually go to senior competitions. If you're watching the World Cup this weekend or past weekend, an event like the men's 1500, you know, you'll see about six or seven uh, skaters in that event alone out of 20 who have podiumed in the all around category of the men's junior all around event within the past five or six years. So, a lot of these skaters, you know, it might take a few years after junior to, to go the full way to the top of the World Cups, but a lot of them do make it. So you, you and your uh, colleague, your friends, actually, your peers, like you, do, you developed a lot of friends in the sport of speed skating, but you also compete against them. Uh, so you, they're, they're your friends, they're your training partners, maybe in some cases schoolmates, and then competitors. So when you're on the line with somebody who is a friend and a schoolmate and somebody you train with, uh, you know, what goes through your mind on the start line? You want to just kick their butt and then, and how does that work? Or is it, is it, I know you, the competition is against the clock uh, and you want to bring out the best in each other. That's the goal, but you also want to win. I mean, so, so what kind of goes through your mind or do you even think of the racer beside you in the lane in an, Olymp in an Olympic style race? Really depends on the competition. A uh, competition like this weekend at Can Am International, you know, it's it's really an event about getting times, throwing down some good practice races for a lot of us older skaters. So you know, I look on the line to the guy next to me. Obviously, I, I wish he has a good race too. Getting beat isn't the biggest deal, especially if we both throw down personal best. But when you get into something like a Canada Cup or a trials event or a championship where the actual placing is is worth a lot more than just the time, then it's then you start looking at your uh, the guy on the line next to you as more of a competitor for sure. Um, you're competing this weekend in the Can-Am. Uh, what disciplines, what race distances are you competing in? This weekend I'm racing the 500 meter, the 1000, and the 15. So you'll race the 1000 tomorrow? That's correct. And then the 500 and the 15 on, uh, on Sunday. What, what, are, what are your preferred distances and what are your favorite distances? It may not be the same. You might think it's might the same question, but... My, my favorite's definitely the 1,000. You know, you get to go all out, hit top speed, but you get a bit more time to actually dial in compared to 500 where it feels very rushed sometimes. Um, and then my preferred distance is probably the, the 5,000 meter, which is probably my strongest right now. 5,000, 12 and a half laps around a 400 meter oval. That is correct, yeah, it's a grind. And just, and you know, I've often said, and other people in the know in the sport have said, the 1500 is the most grueling distance in the sport. Would you, would you agree with that? Definitely depends a bit on the person. I mean, if you ask someone who's a, a pure 500 meter sprinter and, you know, because 
super fast twitch, super strong, but can't hold laps. I'm sure they'd say the same for a 5K, but the 1500 meter definitely has the reputation for you're going all out. It's two minutes long. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when you're going around those corners and you're feeling, you know, the aching pain of every every push, it, it really, really weighs down on you, and it, it's hard to push through for sure. So we're watching the women's 1,000 meter races, and here we got Rachel Spritzen who crossed the line at 138.02, um, um, and uh, she'll like that time. That I believe that will be her personal best. Elizabeth Smith crossed the line at 133.23. Uh, these two skaters are very early in their careers, uh, so they would basically obliterated their times by countless <laughs> seconds, by almost 20 seconds. Uh, that's kind of unheard of as you as the times get um, uh, much lower. Um, and so, but but on the 1,000, like at what point do you, in a, in a race of a 1,000 meter? And I only bring this up because we're watching the, the race. At what point do you go? Uh oh, I am getting really exhausted. It's not can't be the first 500 meters. At what point do you go? Well, it can be the first 500 meters, but then that's not a good sign. <laughs> Ideally, it, you'd be well into the the final backstretch with about one corner to go, when maybe you're hurting, but mentally one corner is a lot easier to tackle. If you haven't come around to the bell lap yet, and and you're really feeling the legs, you might be in trouble. And and when you prepare for, <clears throat> well, when you warm up and warm down for a race, do you do, do you do it the same for every distance or? Like tomorrow, you, would you prepare differently for the 1,000 as you would the 500 and the 15? My 1,000 and my 15 warm-ups are pretty similar. They're both considered, I guess, a, a mid-distance in speed skating. So a lot of skaters in the World Cup circuit would do the 1,000-meter and the 1,500-meter. Um, 500,000 are the sprint distances, so there is some overlap there as well. But the way you'd warm up for a 500, you might do some excels off ice, some sprint yourself, some fast twitch stuff. Whereas for a 5K, you know, you might go on the bike and get a bit warm, a bit sweaty, like really get the body different in a different way, or ready in a different way. So there's definitely different approaches depending on the distance, that's for sure. Okay, so you and your peers have really developed a passion for the sport. I mean, you really are a student of the sport. You've, you've become, and so you know all the, the skaters that, that are in your peer group. You watch the world. You watch other uh, competitions around the world because they have either broadcast or uh, YouTube feeds. Um, and, and so that's an accurate statement, yes? Your passion for yeah, your knowledge I'm, I'm both a speed skater and definitely a speed skating fan at the same time okay so you and your your colleagues you know in the in the hockey world people have hockey drafts right but you have a speed skating draft so that's the first i've heard of it i mean you told me about it last month can you can you explain how that works and and uh, are you in the draft and do you did you, do you pick yourself how does that how does that all work like i know if i pick Sidney crosby in my hockey draft if he gets a number of points, assists, and goals, I'm, it's going to help me in my draft. How does that work in speed skating? Yeah, it's uh, it's, it's similar. You know, you we a bunch of us here at, in the Oval Program. We have about 32 skaters that participate, and it, it we have some in uh, the Netherlands, some in Quebec, some in Manitoba as well. So we we do it online, so everyone you know it's accessible to everyone. But we pick skaters that. You know, if you get top 15 in A group or at World Championships or the Olympics, you get points. And at the end of the year, those points add up and whoever has the most points wins. Um, if you're interested in fantasy speed skating, you can follow along the fantasy speed skating world by going to www.fantasyspeedskating.weebly.com. Shameless plug on that one. And uh, head over to Dad's Calm and read all of the latest fantasy speed skating blog posts that we have uh, posted there about every week. This is something you and your peers have invented? Yeah, we just put the website up, uh, got it rolling, and then uh, there was enough interest uh, with you know skaters across the country to to kind of play with us. Uh, it's you know it's it's a fun way to follow the World Cup circuit, to follow skaters you're less familiar with, to kind of you know you can pick a bunch of Canadians and cheer on your teammates, your peers, your friends. It's it's a really good way to get involved for sure. So it's www what www.fantasyspeedskating.weebly.com and Weebly is W-E-E-B-L-Y Okay, www.fantasyspeedskatingweebly.com well, I'd like to look at that. Now, for those that don't want to do that but follow results somebody's invented this uh, website called speedskatingresults.com It's an amazing resource for times uh, whether they be season's best records, venues um, and so that's easy, speedskatingresults.com. But what are some of the other resources that us 
parents and family members and friends can access uh, in, if you want to learn a little bit more about what's going on. Yeah, so Speed Skin Results is kind of the, the go-to if you're looking for you know, results. If you're a local, you know, parent in Manitoba, I'm sure that those Saturday night time trials are going to be posted on there within a day or two as well. So they have all kinds of events from across the world. Speed Skin Stats is a similar one. It's not updated as quickly, but they have a bit more in-depth stats on a, a lot of different events and races. And then even just on social media, following any of your favorite organizations, be that the International Skating Union or Speed Skate Canada, or even skaters themselves, a lot of them are quite active on social media, and it's an easy way to follow along, uh, you know, see how they're doing, see how training's going, see how racing's going throughout the season. So let's talk about some of the, the speed skating venues uh, that you've been at. Um, most of your venues have been on North American soil, but you've gone abroad internationally. So maybe just talk a little bit about the ones you've attended and, or you've been at and, um, and what are you hearing about Quebec as well? Because we now have, I mean, there's only, there's, o- there's only about 33 or 34 indoor ovals. As uh, Simon Coots and I are talking, you can see the top eight times uh, for the 1,000 meter ladies race. And that, uh, as we were talking, uh, we finished up uh, thir- the 13 1,000 meter pairings. Um, so we're going to take a pause for a moment. And that was about the extent of the pause. And we're moving right into the next, the first nine pairings of the 1,000 meter men's race. Then we'll have a nice um, resurfacing and then move to the balance of the 1,000 meter pairings. In this in this first race uh, coming up, we've got um, we've got uh, 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 uh Callum uh, Makowski, I should say Callum Makowski from Saskatchewan, and uh, Liam McKegg. I'm getting so enthralled in my conversation with Simon that I'm forgetting some of my announcing duties, but that's okay. I've got all weekend to get caught up because one of the things that I think is important is I want these kids to hear their names and hear us talk about them uh, because. Um, um, I can, you know, this is, it's, a, it's developmental. I want them to have a great experience. I want them to feel good about the sport. And I want us to recognize them for taking the, you know, to, lead, to, to, to work towards a passion of theirs. So right now you got Mikowski. you got the Battle of Saskatchewan, the Battle of the Prairies, basically, or one prairie province, Mikowski versus McKeg. So I want to talk about venues. Maybe, maybe, maybe just list off all the venues that you've skated at in your career. Yeah, so, you know, uh, Canada being a large country, luckily the uh, Canada Cup circuit, which is four Canada Cups a year, they spread them out and they constantly change host venues. So um, being on the Canada Cup circuit about the last decade or so, you know, I've skated Fort St. John in BC, I've skated Calgary, I've been able to skate in Red Deer, Saskatoon, Quebec City, Winnipeg, Manitoba. Um, and then down in the States, you know, America Cups uh, sometimes also attract Canadian skaters, just like how this Can-Am competition has attracted some Americans to come up north. So I've been able to skate uh, Roseville and Minneapolis and also Salt Lake City. Uh, and then I've also had the, the opportunity and the pleasure of skating in uh, Tjolf in the, uh, the Netherlands for a training camp as well. How different is the Netherlands skating, uh, the venue there versus, well, some of the venues you talked about are outdoor. Um, have you gotten soft over the years because, you know, be skating mostly indoors? Because you're actually coming to Winnipeg in February for Canada Cup 3. We're going to love to have you back. But uh, talk about the Netherlands venue and uh, how is it skating outdoors now when you spend so much of your time skating indoors? Yeah, I mean, the, the Dutch venue has this uh, amazing reputation for kind of being the, you know, the center of the speed skating world. But uh, the reality of it is that a lot of skating ovals are actually quite similar, which, you know, I guess shouldn't be that surprising. But you go there, the atmosphere is definitely different. You see uh, a lot of Dutch pro teams and Dutch national team skaters. You see some of the best people in the world, which you might not see at a lot of other ovals around the world. But uh, it is it is a very nice facility. As for the difference between indoors and outdoors, you know, I'd hope that uh, I'd hope that I'm not <laughs> getting soft, but... You know, it's hard to tell. I haven't skated outside or raced outside for a number of years, so I guess we'll find out at Canada Cups this season. Okay, I was, I was listening to you. We had um, uh, we have Mitchell Wessling um, from uh, Alberta, and we got Gillam Gould um, from uh, British Columbia. And we just had a lane switch here uh, during the front stretch when really this, the, the lane switching is uh, during the back stretch. So, um, 
So what we'll end up doing here is we'll uh, one of the skaters uh, making that switch, and I wasn't watching at the time. Um, probably will be uh, probably be disqualified. Um, so let me talk to you about that because that's actually kind of important. It is common. It's not an exception to the rule, but it's not a common rule. But early in one's career, especially, and this is a development de primarily a developmental meet. Skaters sometimes forget to switch lanes or they switch it the wrong. What's, what goes on there? Is it just the nerves? Is it just they forget? Is it just very new to them? Yeah, sometimes you know what you're focused on the way you're skating, you're focused on going all out, you're focused on so many different things and the race really does go fast and go by far quicker when you're when you're in the moment yourself rather than when you're watching. So it, it's fairly common. Most people have done it earlier in their career where you fail to switch over the back stretch or uh, you do something funky like in this race where the individual crossed over the front stretch. But you know, mistakes are made, that's part of practice races and eventually you kind of, you know, iron out those little parts. What and have you done that in your in your skating career? Not that I know of, but I'm sure when I was much younger, I I was probably guilty of it as well. Um, have you been disqualified disqualified in, in races over the years? Yeah, you know, every once in a while, you you hit a pylon or a puck, or you cross a line and exit or something, and a ref sees it and they don't like it and they'll disqualify you. It happens, you know, even at the the top level of watching World Cups, you see disqualifications happen every World Cup. So it, no one's immune to it. Accidents happen. Um, you just kind of got to deal with it and move on from there. What about on the start line for you? Have you been DQ'd on the start? I, I have not, but it, uh, it, that's one of the more common ones. If you fall start two times in a row, you do get disqualified and you're out of the race. So we have the Battle of Saskatchewan here. If you've just joined us on YouTube, we got Oscar Stack Makashu uh, in the inside lane, and he'll finish off in the inside lane, and then Max Williams would be a friend and a competitor and a peer group, just kind of what we were talking about with Simon and his, his peers, Max Williams from Saskatchewan, and this is a 1,000-meter men's race, and we're in the third pairing of, of, I think we have 38 pairings is what we have. So this is a very um, this is a very uh, uh, very long day uh, for the 1,000 meters. And uh, but we're joined here with Simon Coots from Winnipeg, Manitoba, a student of the University of Calgary, who's going to have a master's in anthropology. Is this right? Did I remember that correctly? Yeah, that is correct. Master's in anthropology. What does one do with a master's in anthropology? You actually do a lot of things. I'd say anthropology is one of the uh, more under-respected disciplines in university. You know, a lot of people think of uh, anthropology 201 as maybe a running joke in a show like Community where you kind of do nothing. But, uh, you know, you, you get a lot of critical thinking skills, reading and writing. And, these, you know, these are things that you can apply to almost any field. So with the degree that I'm going to be getting, I could work almost anywhere that I'd like. So this, this degree is over, so the spring of 2022, you'll be out of school, correct? Yes, I'll be graduating sometime in the winter semester. And so then, uh, are there organizations that have connected with you or you with them? Uh, it seems like the world is shorted for some odd reason. It, it, there's a supply chain issue in both products, resources, and human capital. Um, that should play into your favor, or will it, with this particular career of choice? I would hope so, but uh, to be honest, I haven't really thought too much about that. You know, well, I'm still skating in school. I'm kind of just taking it one step at a time. So back to Winnipeg. You're coming back to Winnipeg the second week of February, and if the weather conditions work out, it should be a balmy spring meet. Um, but what do you remember about the early days of skating in the Oval and the wind and the cold? And uh, uh, what do you remember about those years? Well, you definitely remember the cold. You remember the wind. You know, half the half a lap is easy, half a lap is hard. Every time you come in and out, your feet are freezing. Uh, one of the the downsides of Winnipeg, despite having actually a very nice outdoor oval, is that it's attached to a pool, so very humid. So you know, the temperature change coming inside to outside is always unpleasant. But you know, growing up skating there, that's where I first fell in love with the sport, and you really become attached to it. And I'm definitely excited to go back and skate on the home ice again. Well, good to have you back, um, and uh, it'll be all the skaters in Winnipeg, uh, long track skaters, that won't be competing at the Olympics, correct? 
That is correct, yeah. It would be Canada Cup 3, and it is for ranking. So it goes on the same time as the Olympics. At the Olympics, you can still earn points on the Canada Cup circuit as well. But for skaters not at the Olympics, their opportunity to make the national team, uh, earn a national team suit, and possibly get funded, that all happens at Canada Cup 3. So that's in Winnipeg. But let's talk about what's happening. Well, I want to talk about some upcoming events, but probably the, the, the – probably the, um, I don't want to say the pinnacle of events, but probably the most intriguing event – of the long track season. And by the way, as the emblem crosses a line uh, at a time of, let me get it, at uh, 134.77 and, and Evan Boyce at 135.22. The, uh, we're now moving to the fifth pairing, by the way, and um, I'm trying to toggle back and forth, have a conversation with Simon Coots and do some announcing. And, and uh, so I got a couple of joint duties. I think we have Simon here till the the balance of uh, these pairings, and then he's off and, um, and for training uh, uh, number two. But this is the fifth pairing. Merrick uh, Showman from Alberta and Matthias or Matthias Daniels uh, from British Columbia. And uh, there they go. They start on their 1,000 meters. So let's go back to upcoming events. First of all, do you have, other than the can International, what events do you have between now and Christmas? So we have uh, Canada Cup 1 in Quebec City the first weekend of December. So a lot of the skaters at this competition here, you know, this is kind of building towards that weekend, which is for ranking. And then Canada Cup 2, which is also junior trials and also Olympic trials, which is the big one, that's taking place the last week of December in Quebec City that's as well. That's between Christmas and New Year's, and you'll be at that event? Yeah, that will t it starts the 27th of December and goes until um, the final day of the year. And that is, uh, you know, the big one that basically every skater on the Canada Cup circuit uh, and every junior in the country who wants a shot at making the junior national team, you know, they'll all be there that week. So it's for all the marbles. So let's start with the fact that it's an Olympic, it's an Olympic season. Uh, it's an Olympic year. So this is where the, it's this event that basically will decide who's going to represent our country in Be Beijing at the Ice Ribbon, correct? That is correct, yeah. Outside of a few skaters who will be pre-selected in a, a number of events based off their rankings in the World Cup this year at the first four World Cups, which the second one takes place this weekend in Norway. Um, other than those select few, most of us will be battling out in Quebec City at the end of the year for Olympic spots. Well, let's spend some time on the Olympics and then let's distill it down a little bit to the Canada Cup and the Junior Worlds. So who's gonna, who do you think will be pre-selected? Uh, it'll be very probably similar to the to the World Cup selection, uh, but maybe talk about some of the some of the skaters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, even just looking at the World Cups now, you can kind of get a taste of who's having a strong start to the year, which puts them in a good spot for Olympic selection. Uh, Laurent de Bray in the men's 500,000 is coming out very strong this year. Uh, Isabel Weidman and Evendy Blondet in the longer distances on the woman's side and Evendy in the mass start, they're off to a good start as well. And Ted Jan Bloman in the men's 5,000 meter and hopefully also the 10k tomorrow he's having a good start to the season as well so these are these are guys that will probably be in a very safe spot going into the first world cup or sorry the the olympic qualifiers at the end of the month so if i mention a bunch of names these are basically household names in the speed skating community brooklyn mcdougall marcia hooty uh, kaylin irvin heather mclean valerie malte uh, madison perriman uh, gilmore junio uh, Vincent de Hatra, Antoine Jelenet Beaulieu. Uh, I'm just trying to think of uh, Tejan Bloman, Graham Fish, Jordan Belcho, Caesar, Isabel Weideman. Um, these are these are names. Evany Blondin. These are names that are synonymous with long track speed skating, and and the majority, if not all, will probably go to the Olympics. But who might be a dark horse? Who might who might just come out of? Who's a possibility to to light some fire under the skaters that I've mentioned? Um, and surprise, surprise themselves and, and certainly their peers. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, there's definitely a lot of depth in a lot of our distances, so nothing set in stone. Anyone can really make it at this point, but there's a couple of skaters that have shown a lot of promise that maybe haven't reached the level that they, uh, they have the ability to. Want to be in our men's 500 event, Cooper Eamon, super strong 500-meter skater from Nova who, Scotia, who's which racing, is not super common. Who's racing here. Yep. That's correct. He races more, and he's racing again, um, I think, this afternoon in 1,000 as well mm -hmm. at the end of this event. But uh, he's, he's one skater to keep an eye on in the men's 500 for an Olympic spot for sure. Yeah, he's first off, actually, after the ice reschedule. Uh, anybody else come to mind? 
Uh, we have a couple distances, like the, the men's 1500, where we have a lot of depth. So the top skaters you see at the World Cups this fall might not be the guys that go to the Olympics because we have five or six guys that could absolutely make that distance uh, with an Olympic spot. So someone like Jake Weidman right now, who's kind of on the cusp, he has a, a very strong chance of showing up in Quebec City at the end of the year and throwing down a top three time. So we are looking on the screen in the YouTube feed with pairing number seven. We got Aaron Reel from Manitoba and Miko Veeman from Saskatchewan. Uh, Reel will finish off his race in the uh, inner lane, the same uh, lane that he started in, and Miko will be the outer lane. Maybe, Simon, we could talk about Olympic style versus mass start and what's the difference between the two and... Um, and uh, so, yeah, so maybe just talk about the two for those that maybe are new to the sport of speed skating. Absolutely. So what we're watching right now is Olympic style. Each racer has their own lane where you switch on the backstretch every lap. It's a 400 meter track. And uh, this, is, this is what you mostly see in speed skating and international speed skating at competitions. But the last uh, six years or seven years, they've really grown this mass start side of speed skating. So there's only one event that goes on mass start style right now, which is also an Olympic event currently. So you're not getting confused with the Olympic style being exclusively just the Olympic events. But the mass start event is between 16 and 24 skaters that line up on the line at the same time. And they have the entire track to themselves, including the warm plane. Uh, and it is a 16 lap race, so close to six kilometers with sprint points every four laps. And the podium is decided by the final three that cross the line. And so what's the strategy? Okay, so the, uh, the strategy obviously within the Olympic style, it, within each distance has its own strategy, depends on where the, devel the, the, level, of the, the, the level of development for the skater. So um, you're not going to race the 500 the same way you're going to race the 5,000 meter. We were clear on that and we talked about that earlier. But the mass start is, is entertaining, uh, exciting, and, and even E. Blondin is one of the pro most prolific mass start skaters in the country and maybe even in the world. What, 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 what's the strategy she or others should employ and what makes her so good? Well, you have to be strong because it is, it is a long race, 16 laps, even if you're not going all out the whole time. It's still a lot of time in base position and a lot of time on the ice. But it does come down to a sprint finish, and you'll see skaters throwing down laps in the MMS start that you would compare to something like in a 1,000 or 1,500 meters. So they're still hitting very high speeds. Sometimes it's deceiving on camera. It's hard to tell how fast skaters are going, but the, the end of the mass start is always very, very fast. The, the strategy that you see a lot of employ is, you know, staying in the pack, doing as little work as possible, and taking advantage of the draft, which really makes it a lot easier to, to hold that pace. Countries often have two skaters. They get two spots each for the distance. So if they have two that qualify for the final, often you'll see uh, one skater out front leading laps so the other one can sit in and go for the final spot. Uh, a little bit of team skating. It's That's often, a lot uh, like Tour de France, strategy. right? They pick on one cyclist to say, you're the lead dog, so to speak. Exactly. And then you'll they support them. that, the, 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 lead, uh, the lead athlete. Exactly. You'll see an athlete get let out by a teammate and then hopefully they can go for gold. And, you know, it, it, it's... It's a much better strategy than kind of everyone goes their own way because if you get caught up in the pack and it's going too slow or someone makes a break and no one closes it, often the race is lost or won very early on. So they've inst implemented this sprint lap uh, just in recent years because I've seen mass starts for seven and ten laps where they've just gone really slow for almost the entire race and then sprinted the last two laps. You're forced, you're forced every three or four laps to go as fast as you possibly can. Not necessarily. The sprint laps are really important in the qualifier. So if you break and you get sprint points, you have a good chance of making the final, which would be the top eight in your race. But uh, when it comes to it in the final race, the podium is decided by the first three across the line at the very end. So if you go for a break early you can, and you hold it, you can still win. But going for sprint points is actually fighting for fourth place. I see. So there's a whole strategy behind this. And that's interesting. Okay, so we've talked about okay, so we talked about this Quebec event, three speed skating meets wrapped in one. And what you're watching on uh, the TV now, the YouTube is you're seeing a couple legends, Bill Blonsky and and uh, Werner Meyer. Werner, okay, they're they're inspirations on two from two perspectives. Werner Meyer, who's well into his 80s, um, 
uh, is obviously uh, athletic and agile and mobile, and here he is speed skating around an oval two and a half times at 1,000 meters. Uh, Bill Blonsky had an accident years ago, and um, and uh, speed skating is a, a passion that he's continued to pursue um, to assist with his functionality. And uh, and uh, these two guys, uh, I would say, are, are inspirations from two different perspectives. And uh, they're here every meet. I'm here. And uh, so I might have to put on some Rocky music here in a, shortly. So let's talk about, okay, so now the Olympic skate off is what they're calling it. For the Olymp that's between Christmas and New Year's. Then you have the regular Canada Cup too that you're going to compete in. And what would be your goal down there? My goal would be to, uh, to finish high up in the rankings as possible for Canada Cup. You know, these are the rankings that decide who's on the national team next year. So distances like the 5,000 meter where I'm a bit more competitive, obviously I'd like to, to place as high as possible. Okay. And then uh, the Junior World Championships. Uh, these, are, uh, these are kids anywhere from, well, we talked about the category, right? We talked about, there's the bell lap, by the way. I'm going to put on some uh, rocky music for these guys. Uh, to play them as they as they head uh, as they head around for their final uh, 400 meter, meters. Um, but talk about the junior world championships and and um, uh, ages 16 to 19. And um, what's uh, how many do they select? And where's the event? And and uh, maybe expand on that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. So running at the same time as the Canada Cup 2 and the Olympic Trials and Skate Off at the end of December this year is also Junior Trials. So this is a trials event for Junior World Championships, which is taking place later in the season in Innsbruck, Austria. And uh, it is an all-around event, so skaters will be selected based off their 500,000, 15, and either 3K or 5K, whether they're men or women. And it'll be your uh, your combined SAMLOG. So it's a scoring system that combines your four times, and the top four for both men and women will go to this junior event and represent Canada on the world stage. Well, that's exciting, and the and they take uh, and so there's. Um are there, is there any uh, skaters that, that uh, do you know of any skaters that have the possibility of getting there? I mean, uh, I think Laura Hall on the women's side is, oh, I guess you could say, can, I guess you can never really say in the sport of speed skating it's a lock. But she would be the closest thing to Shewin, though. She's been quite dominant the last few years, and her times have been impressive and still improving. So having some experience at Junior World Championships already, she's definitely uh, got a leg up on the other girls. But you really never know with skaters coming from across the country. Some of them haven't had the benefit of skating on Calgary ice, which is faster and throwing down better PBs. There's always uh, Quebecois skaters that show up just for the event from short track that are quite strong. So you really never know until the trials happens. Well, who else are really? Are they is it Anna Bourgeois might be a contender? No, she would be a neo senior. Oh, she's a neo senior. Okay, and your Anna Fournier, I think, is the word, is the skater I might be thinking of. Possibly yes, but I'm not very familiar with skaters uh, of that age at, group at right the now. Junior grade. Okay, all right. Well, it's 156, and I've shunned my duties as an announcer, but I've also. Uh, did it at the expense of and the joy of talking to Simon Coots, who, by the way, is my nephew by marriage, my wife's sister's son, uh, a delight. I've watched him grow up and blossom into this tremendous young man and beautiful speed skater. And Simon, um, while we don't have a, uh, a camera on you, uh, you, you support a Joe Thornton beard that is, I understand, has been on for a year and is going to be shaved off on November 23rd. Why don't you talk a little bit about the beard as we wind down and uh, wind down our talk? Yeah, so I'm um, currently growing a year, day 360, so we're near the end. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things I think all um, young men should try at some point in their lives. And COVID gave me the perfect opportunity to grow a disgusting and shameless beard while no one could see me quarantining at home. So, you know, I took the opportunity and uh, made the most of it. But yes, it is true. On Tuesday, it is coming off. So for those around the Oval, you luckily won't have to see it anymore. Well, years ago, you used to have very, very long hair as a young teenager. And if you recall the story we talked about when we had dinner a couple months ago, and I was sharing it with a good friend of yours, that uh, I offered you a lot of money to, get your, to cut your hair because it was very long. And you were very determined to not have it cut no matter how much I offered you. 
And that's a sign of somebody who's passionate and uh, sticks to his guns and values. And uh, so I hope you had fun today. I did. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me on. No, you're welcome. And I'd like to have you back as, uh, as a speed skating dad and to come out uh, and as we develop this YouTube feed to keep those that are watching their families and friends provide just a little bit more excitement into their life than just a screen of skaters. Um, let's fill it with some, uh, some speed skating knowledge. And, and for, for the way I see it, we've just scratched the surface. And when uh, I'd like to bring you back, when there's an opportunity when we have some of your a lot of the skaters that you know and we can talk a little bit about them as well absolutely be a pleasure simon coots thank you so much and i wish you all the best with your training and good luck with the 1000 meter tomorrow and the 500 and the 1500 on sunday absolutely thank you and i uh, hope everyone else enjoys watching the rest of the weekend it should be a good one so that concludes the this portion this portion we've got an ice resurfacing and we are back on let me find out At 10 minutes after 2, we will be coming back. It does. It just says that right on the screen. 10 minutes after 2 uh, to resume the 1,000 meter uh, men here at the Can-Am International Long Track Speed Skating Competition here in Calgary, Alberta.